Hello, uh, and welcome to this afternoon session. Uh, we have two talks in this session on the conformal bootstrap. Uh, we start off with David Simmons Duffin from Caltech, who will review recent developments in the subject. OK, thank you very much to the organizers for organizing this wonderful conference and for inviting me to speak here. So I was asked to talk about developments in the conformal bootstrap, recent developments. Um, and by now, this is a pretty big subject. So I'm going to cut one quirky path for the subject. And I thought I'd take a hint from one of the other speakers and change to a more informal title in honor of that. OK, so what's new with the bootstrap? So let me start by uh, reviewing the conformal boot bootstrap very briefly. So the starting point of the conformal bootstrap is to study a four-point function of primary operators in a conformal field theory. So here's the four-point function. And for simplicity, I've taken them to be identical. And we can compute this four-point function by uh, inserting a complete set of states between pairs of operators in radial quantization. So here's a pair of operators, phi of x1, phi of x2. Here's another pair. And we've inserted a complete set of states uh, between them. And furthermore, one can organize these states using conformal symmetry. So here the sum over O runs over primary operators in the theory, and alpha and beta are descendants. The advantage of using symmetry to organize this sum over states is that conformal symmetry fixes the sum over descendants up to a coefficient. So doing this sum over descendants, we get an expression for the four-point function in this form. We have a square of a three-point coefficient, one three-point coefficient from this three-point function, and another three-point coefficient from this three-point function, times a special function of the positions that's completely fixed by symmetry and is called a conformal block. So for example, the conformal block, uh, after pulling out some dimensionful factors, just becomes a function of z and z bar, which are some conformal cross ratios. Now, this way of computing the, in this way of computing the four-point function, we had to make a choice of which pairs of operators to insert states between. And this choice seemingly breaks the permutation symmetry uh, between the operators. But of course, the original four-point function is permutation symmetric, and it shouldn't care about how we choose to compute it. And this means we can derive different, seemingly different expressions for the same object, and those different expressions have to be the same. And this is the statement of crossing symmetry. So here is the conformal block expansion that we derived above. And here's the same conformal block expansion with 1 and 3 swapped. And the statement is that these two expressions should be equal to each other. And this is an interesting equation because uh, the symmetry under swapping 1 and 3 certainly does not hold term by term. So as a consequence, the crossing symmetry mixes up an infinite number of terms on this side with an infinite number of terms on this side and constrains the three-point functions f phi phi o, and the scaling dimensions delta o and spins j o uh, in terms of themselves in an interesting way. And another important constraint uh, appearing in the conformal block expansion comes from unitarity. Uh, and one consequence of unitarity is that these three-point coefficients are real. One can choose a basis of operators such that the three-point coefficients are real. And thus, their squares are positive. And furthermore, the dimensions appearing in the conformal block decomposition satisfy some basic inequalities coming from unitarity. So that's a simple enough uh, derivation of a relatively simple looking equation. Um, but, uh, and this equation has been known for decades. But uh, it was a long time before anyone was able to extract interesting, useful information out of this equation in higher than two space-time dimensions. And there was a renaissance in this subject uh, due to Rotazzi, Richkov, Tani, and Vicky in 2008, who wrote down an algorithm for placing bounds on the data entering this equation. So using conformal symmetry, uh, which, which gives you the conformal block expansion, crossing symmetry, and unitarity, uh, this algorithm gives general bounds on scaling dimensions and OP coefficients. And uh, in numerical investigations using this algorithm over the past 10 years, one of the main things we've learned is that crossing symmetry and unitarity is surprisingly powerful, even in higher than two space-time dimensions. An example consequence of crossing symmetry and unitarity 
Um, uh, an interesting example is in the 3D icing model. So the claim is that by using this algorithm, one can show that uh, the leading scaling dimensions in the 3D icing model are constrained to lie inside this tiny island. And this constraint actually determines the leading critical exponents in this theory to six or seven decimal places. And this constraint just comes from studying a simple system of three four-point functions in this theory. The statement is that crossing symmetry and unitarity for those four-point functions is sufficiently powerful to get this result. So this leads to some challenges that uh, people working on the bootstrap are currently struggling with. One challenge is to achieve a similar story for other interesting conformal field theories in various dimensions, say, with varying amounts of supersymmetry. Another thing that this algorithm makes possible is making general statements about the space of conformal field theories. So you might hope to use it to map out the space of CFTs. In the meantime, we have all this interesting numerical information, um, but there's a burning question uh, of how we can explain these results. So the numerics tell us that the crossing equations contain a lot of interesting information, and the challenge is to understand this information and extract it in an efficient way. One of the types of information that the crossing symmetry together, that crossing symmetry together with unitarity encodes uh, is the average null energy condition that Tom talked about earlier. And that was one of the main themes of his talk, that the ANEC is really a consequence of unitarity. And so we could ask, what else? Are there any other simple conditions that are generally applicable that are encoded uh, in these constraints? And for example, what can we learn about ADS-CFT? So those are some of the main challenges uh, in this field. And in this talk, I'm going to mostly talk about progress in understanding the crossing equations analytically and extracting more efficient information from it, uh, from them. And um, we aren't at the point where we can reproduce numerical uh, bootstrap results analytically completely, but we can reproduce some of them, and there's a lot better understanding now of the crossing equations than there, there was just a couple years ago. So that will be the main focus of this talk. So one of the big developments in this field that's led to a lot of new understanding it was the introduction of a Lorenzian inversion formula by Karen Ho. The Lorenzian inversion formula unifies many different analytic bootstrap studies that people have undertaken in the last few years. Uh, and it also introduces some new conceptual ideas in particular, analyticity and spin. So in this talk, I will use the Lorenzian inversion formula to explore some of the physics of the crossing equation, try to pick apart how it works, um, and give you some examples of the kind of things that you can deduce from it. And in part, convince you that the Lorenzian inversion formula is a very efficient tool for getting this information. I'll also use the Lorenzian inversion formula as a lens to understand some recent works in this area. And I should emphasize that several of these works did not use the inversion formula themselves, but they used uh, conceptual ideas that are encoded in the inversion formula in a very simple way. So by understanding the inversion formula, we'll be able to look at these works and understand sort of what they're doing and why they were able to make progress and what some of the challenges are for the future. And then finally, I want to uh, explain analyticity in spin a little bit. At first, it sounds a little mysterious. Um, what could that possibly mean? And I want to try to demystify it and explain why it's, it's interesting and cool. OK, so in order to introduce the Lorenzian inversion formula, I need to first introduce some ancient technology and this is the idea of harmonic analysis for the Euclidean conformal group, which was first applied to conformal field theories uh, in the 70s. And there's this big, mostly impenetrable book about the subject that, that uh, you can look at if you're interested. I hope none of the authors are watching this. <laughs> so harmonic analysis instructs us to write the four-point function in a slightly different way from what I had a few slides ago. 
uh, what we should do is write the four-point function as a sum over spins and an integral over complex dimensions over the principal series. So this is an integral that runs in the imaginary direction. Inside the integral is a coefficient function, c of delta j, that encodes the dynamics of the theory. That depends on the theory. And it multiplies a conformal partial wave that's fixed by conformal symmetry. And this conformal partial wave is essentially just a conformal block. It's a sum of, a, it's a sum of two conformal blocks. And that distinction won't be very important for us. The relationship between this way of writing the four-point function and the previous way of writing the four-point function is as follows. So first, we should imagine that this coefficient function is a sum over poles, where the positions of the poles are on the real axis at the locations of physical operators of the theory. And the residues of the poles are products of OPE coefficients. So then one would do, what one does is take the contour integral over delta, which runs in an imaginary direction, and deform it to instead go around the poles. And when you do that, you pick up the contribution of each pole, and the integral over delta turns into a sum over discrete values of delta, and that's the conformal block decomposition. And for those of you who've, who've studied the SYK model, this will probably look extremely familiar. This is the way, uh, these are the tools that Stanford and Maldasena used to solve the four-point function in SYK. And essentially, they were using uh, harmonic analysis for SL2R. So here, we're just doing harmonic analysis for the higher dimensional conformal group. The advantage of using these conformal partial waves with these funny principal series dimensions, these complex dimensions, is that they satisfy a nice orthogonality condition. The statement of orthogonality is that if you take two partial waves, multiply them, integrate over all of Euclidean space, modulo the conformal group, then the result is proportional to a delta function. And this immediately lets us write down what I'll call a Euclidean inversion formula for this dynamical data, C of delta j, in terms of an integral of the four-point function against a partial wave. And this Euclidean inversion formula, in principle, allows us to extract information about the CFT from the four-point function. Um, but uh, it's not nearly as efficient as the Lorenzian inversion formula, for some reasons that I'll explain soon. So uh, this is the setting that we're working in, working in. And the key point is that there exists this function C of delta j that encodes together the dynamical information of the theory, the dimensions uh, and OP coefficients, and we want to be able to study it and learn things about it. OK, the Lorenzian inversion formula is another expression for C delta j that's different from the Euclidean inversion formula in, in some important ways. The statement is that C of delta j is equal to some factors. Some gamma, these turn out to be just some gamma functions times an integral of cross ratios over a square times a funny conformal block where spin and dimension have been swapped with each other, times not the four-point function, but a double commutator of the four-point function. This double commutator is some linear combination of analytic continuations of the four-point function. So if you, uh, if you strip off these dimensionful factors, you're instructed to take the four-point function in the Euclidean regime, subtract from it what you would get if you took z bar around 1 in one direction, and subtract what you would get by taking z bar around 1 in the other direction. And that gives the double commutator. And another word I'll use for this is the double discontinuity. And the double discontinuity featured uh, prominently in Tom's talk this morning. So the nice features of the Lorenzian inversion formula that I want to emphasize and explain in this talk are, are as follows. One statement is that it vastly simplifies large spin perturbation theory. And I'll explain what large spin perturbation theory is and why it's important and interesting uh, shortly. Another important property of this uh, formula is that it determines all of this dynamical data purely in terms of the double discontinuity. And the double discontinuity can be much simpler than the four-point function itself. This depends on the setting you're working in. Um, but we'll see many, many examples where the double discontinuity is easy to compute and therefore gives you an easy route to determining a huge amount of data about the CFT. Another important property 
is that the double discontinuity is positive. And this is essentially the key idea behind the average null energy condition, at least the bootstrap-based proof of the average null energy condition that Tom described uh, this morning. So I won't spend very much time on positivity uh, for that, see Tom's talk. And, and another, uh, perhaps one of the most interesting, but also most mysterious uh, features of this inversion formula is analyticity in spin. So you can see in this formula that because dimension and spin have been swapped in the conformal block, spin is sitting in the slot usually allotted to dimension. And of course, we're used to dimensions taking continuous values. So this conformal block makes perfect sense for complex J. And there's nothing stopping you from sticking a complex value of J into the formula and computing. Uh, you're only left with the question, what on earth did I just compute? But what this formula tells you is that all this dynamical data, the OP coefficients and operator dimensions of the theory, fits together into an analytic function of spin. And it's not just any analytic function of spin. It's an analytic function of spin that has nice properties at infinity in the J plane. That also follows from this formula. So towards the end of the talk, I want to explain uh, what this means and, and the significance of it. OK, so let me start by talking about large spin perturbation theory. So the idea behind large spin perturbation theory is that even in a non-perturbative CFT, 1 over j can be a good expansion parameter. Uh, and this is a theme that has shown up in uh, uh, a few different situations where j has different meanings. But here, j will be spin. Uh, so you can make progress on describing some CFT data, even in a non-perturbative CFT. And the idea of large spin perturbation theory is to extract some dynamics of the CFT purely from crossing symmetry. That is, using information that's completely non-perturbative. And one of the reasons you might be interested in large spin perturbation theory, one of the reasons that you should be interested in it if you're working on the numerical bootstrap, is that it actually explains a lot of the numerical data uh, coming out uh, of these studies. So for example, in the 3D icing CFT, we currently understand dimensions of about 112 operators in the theory. And of these 112 operators, almost all of them fall into families that are well described by large spin perturbation theory. This is an example. These are the uh, lowest twist operators at each spin. Here, tau is the twist, which is dimension minus spin. And h bar, you should think of as essentially being spin in this plot. The dots are numerical data. And the curve is computed using large spin perturbation theory. And you can see that there's a nice match between them. One of the things this is telling us is that the numerical bootstrap is working extremely hard to reproduce large spin perturbation theory. Um, but on the other hand, we can do large spin perturbation theory analytically. So it means that uh, we know at least something better than the numerics. Uh, and we should try to bring these together. So that's one reason large spin perturbation theory is interesting. Another reason that it's interesting, um, as we'll see, uh, in several of the next few slides, is that it gives a useful way of organizing computations, even in perturbative theories, even in theories with small parameters. OK, so here's how to succeed at large spin perturbation theory without trying, without really trying. So uh, what do you do if you want to study large spin? You set j to be large. And then you're basically done. So what you do is you take the inversion formula, and you set j large. When you do that, the conformal block in the inversion formula takes this form, approximately this form. And you can see that large j pushes you away from z equals z bar equals 0, which we'll call the s channel. So that's the channel in which you're trying to derive the OP data. It pushes you towards the, the t channel. It pushes you, in particular, towards z bar equals 1. So we have to do an integral over a square of this thing times the double discontinuity of the four-point function. This factor is pushing us towards z bar equals 1. And it turns out that poles, which are the things we care about, the poles contain the dynamical information of the theory, come from this region of small z. And there's a symmetry 
in this square. So I'm just focusing on the upper triangle for simplicity. So the fact that we're pushed towards the T channel, towards Z bar equals one, means that we can use an expansion of the four point function in that channel. And the leading contribution in the T channel is given just by the unit operator. So this is the contribution of the unit operator in the T channel. And this is a good approximation for the four point function in the regime where we want it. So all we need to do is take an integral of this funny conformal block, which is turned into this simple factor, times the unit operator in the T channel. And this is what we get. We get poles at the, uh, at the following locations. We get poles at, uh, such that the twist of the operator in the S channel is equal to two delta phi. We're here, phi is the uh, operator whose four point function we're studying. And there's another pole at twist two delta phi plus two, and, and so on. And this is the correct answer. So at large spin, the four point function is dominated by so-called double twist operators. You can think of these double twist operators as being what you would get if you took phi and sandwiched a bunch of derivatives uh, between them and then another phi. This expression is schematic, doesn't really make sense in a general non-perturbative uh, CFT, but the claim is that it does make sense at large spin. So these states have to be there at asymptotically large spin. And these double twist states have dimension equal to what you would get from naive counting, just summing up the dimensions of each of these things, plus some anomalous dimension that's suppressed at large spin. So the inversion formula gives you these double, double twist states immediately from a simple integral. And the next thing you might do is include another block in the T channel to get a better approximation to what's going on. So let's include another conformal block in the T channel, not just the unit operator, but say the uh, next leading twist operator, maybe the stress tensor. And this contributes the following to our coefficient function C of delta J. So again, it has poles at the locations of double twist operators. And this pole here is correcting the OPE coefficient. It gives some large spin correction to the OPE coefficient of double twist operators. And then there's a double pole which gives an anomalous dimension. So just plugging this thing into the inversion formula, doing the integral, you get an anomalous dimension that you can express as a series in one over J. And it goes like one over J to the tau prime, where tau prime is the twist of the operator that we included in the T channel. And the expressions you get uh, from the inversion integral agree with all orders asymptotic expansions in one over J that were worked out previously. So this is an extremely efficient way to reproduce those uh, large spin results to all orders in one over J. Um, and here's a cartoon uh, for, to, to help visualize what's going on. So this is, this is a diagram that's supposed to represent uh, this contribution to double twist operators. And we can read the diagram in two different ways. So reading from left to right is the T channel. From left to right, we have two phi's. We take their OPE and they have O prime appearing in the OPE. It's exchanged uh, with these two other phi's. Reading from bottom to top, what we have is a sort of two phi state, a two particle state, that gets some correction to its energy from exchanging O prime. Okay, so we might try to keep going. Let's do better. Let's include all the operators in the T channel uh, and see what happens. Um, so if we do this, the simplest thing to do is to use the inversion integral block by block in the T channel. And if you do that, you're led to a problem. The problem is that every T channel operator that we include contributes the exact same thing. It contributes a single pole and a double pole. And this is a statement, this is a consequence of representation theory. What we're really doing here is exploring the poles of the 6J symbol or crossing kernel for the Euclidean conformal group. So every operator gives us this. But that's not the correct answer. The correct answer is that the poles of the double twist states should be shifted by some finite amount. So what we want to see is the anomalous dimension appearing in the denominator. And that means we should be looking for a series that includes not, not just single poles, but double poles and triple poles and all higher poles. And the only way one can get this is by first summing an infinite number of 
informal blocks in the T channel. Uh, and what, uh, what should happen is that there should be large spin families of operators in the T channel whose sums give some kind of exponentiation of ladder diagrams. So for example, this triple pole comes from a, a sum over large spin operators in the T-channel. A quadruple pole would come from uh, doubly large spin operators in the T-channel, and so on. So what you find is that in order for the crossing equation to work, you need not just double twist operators, but arbitrary multi-twist operators. So we're seeing that, that the crossing equation for a single four-point function knows about the existence of a complete Fox space of states at large spin. You can think of these large spin states as being like particles in ADS that are spinning, spinning around each other and they're all very far separated from each other. This entire Fox space is necessary for the consistency of a single crossing equation. And this analysis comes uh, pretty easily out of just exploring the inversion formula and how it works. So this actually leads to a difficult problem, which is if you want to actually uh, use the inversion formula, basically what we're seeing is that is a consequence of the fact that the inversion integral is only guaranteed to work on the principal series. And to understand the physical data of the theory, we want to move away from the principal series onto the real axis. And we're seeing some kind of tension between those things. To get into the physical region, we need to at least be able to sum all of these multi-twist states. So that's, I think, a big challenge for, uh, for the analytic bootstrap, understanding how to sum the multi-twist states in particular, how to organize the spectrum. One of the puzzles is that no individual operator uh, can be called a multi-twist operator. Every operator looks the same. The notion of double twist, triple twist, and so on only makes sense for infinite families of operators. So it's not clear how to organize the spectrum, but small parameters can be extremely useful for this. So that's the next thing we're gonna do. We're gonna look at the case of theories with small parameters where you can use another small parameter to help organize the spectrum and make progress. Okay, and the theme that will appear when we look at theories of small parameters is the simplicity of this double discontinuity, the fact that it's so much simpler than the four-point function itself. So uh, as a first example, let's consider a large n theory. So the four-point function is at leading order just a sum of products of two-point functions. And then uh, let's say our correction, the next correction is ordered by, is, is down by one over n squared. The next one is down by one over n to the fourth, and I'll refer to this as tree level and one loop. So in this setting, uh, we can organize operators into single traces and multi-traces, and the double trace operators in particular have some dimension, some uh, zeroth order dimension, plus a tree level anomalous dimension, a one loop anomalous dimension, and so on. Now, the key observation is that if we study the double discontinuity of a T-channel block, we're instructed to do some analytic continuations and some of analytic continuations of the block, and out pops this factor. And this factor means that most of the states at leading order don't contribute to the double discontinuity. So you can see that we have a sine squared of twist minus two delta phi, which means that any state with twist close to two delta phi or two delta phi plus, uh, plus an even integer uh, won't contribute. So what this means is that at order one over n squared, only single trace operators contribute to the double discontinuity. And this lets you determine all tree level double trace data in terms of single trace data. You can go further. At one loop, double traces contribute proportional to the square of their tree level anomalous dimensions. So you can then get one loop double trace data from the square of tree level. So one interpretation of this is that the four-point function is uh, uh, the four-point function is some disconnected piece plus what we usually call the amplitude. The single discontinuity isolates the amplitude. The double discontinuity gets us the imaginary part of the amplitude, and the imaginary part of the amplitude can be quite simple. So in in a cartoon, uh, what this what this looks like is that the tree-level four-point function can be determined just from single trace data. And the one loop four point function can be determined from the square of tree level data. And the observation that this was possible, I think, uh, first appeared, or one of the earliest places it appeared, was in this paper, not using the inversion formula, but understanding in detail the structure of large spin perturbation theory. 
And uh, they were able to use these ideas to compute uh, a non-trivial loop diagram in ADS. And um, again, the key point is the structure of the way these different contributions enter the double discontinuity. These ideas have been taken further in the last uh, year or so to compute loop corrections in n equals 4 supering mills at strong coupling. The double discontinuity at tree level is extremely simple because it includes just the stress tensor multiplet, um, at, at least in, in simple cases. More generally, one needs to um, understand how to, um, one needs one, one needs a good formula to proceed. One needs a good formula for tree level correlation functions um, uh, in this theory, and that was provided recently by this group. So using these ideas together with tree level information, people have been able to uh, essentially bootstrap uh, one loop corrections and n equals four supering mills at strong coupling. And so all of these ideas are essentially the CFT incarnation of familiar on-shell unitarity cut methods from amplitudes. And in fact, uh, one of the things shown in this paper is that the flat space limit of the inversion formula is essentially a familiar um, dispersion relation uh, in uh, ten-dimensional supergravity. So this is this is the, the I think the beginning of something really interesting. The beginning of really importing on-shell methods from amplitudes into CFT to compute correlators at strong coupling, and it leads to a natural question of whether higher loop techniques from amplitudes can be imported as well. How far can, can one get? Um, and this, the on-shellness of this is the fact that we're only using the, the crossing equation. We're just using these uh, boundary observables and the uh, properties they have to satisfy. So another example of a small parameter uh, making things simple um, is in the Wilson-Fisher theory. So if you try to look at the Wilson-Fisher theory uh, um, and you look at the double discontinuity, the four-point function, you find that to the first few non-trivial orders, uh, only two operators contribute to the double discontinuity, the unit operator and phi squared. And this means that from a single application of the inversion formula to these two operators, you can determine anomalous dimensions in the theory up to order epsilon cubed. Uh, and this, uh, I think this fact, the simplicity of the double discontinuity in this theory is to a large extent behind uh, a lot of the success of the Mellon bootstrap for the Wilson-Fisher theory um, that you maybe have been hearing about in the last few years. One can actually go further in this case uh, using another interesting idea from amplitudes. So if you want to, if you want to get to order epsilon to the fourth, you're faced with a complicated mixing problem. Essentially, you're faced with a mini version of this problem of disentangling multi-twist states. Uh, and there was an interesting idea to uh, use the idea of transcendentality. So uh, we know what loop order these contributions should come from, and we know something about the types of, uh, of functions that can appear at that loop order. So this group just wrote down a basis of functions with the appropriate transcendentality and fixed the coefficients of this basis um, using consistency with, uh, with other parts of the four-point function. So the double discontinuity is simple enough that you can actually do this, and that lets you get to a higher order. So they computed uh, for the first time the epsilon to the fourth correction to the central charge, the Wilson-Fisher theory. And there are other examples of theories of small parameters that have been studied, and essentially the underlying theme is the simplicity of the double discontinuity and the fact that even though it's simple, it really determines the full four-point function. Uh, and I should say in, in the 3D icing model, um, the fact that the double discontinuity is simple also shows up in trying to compare between analytics and numerics. So the anomalous dimensions of, oops, the anomalous dimensions of leading twist operators, those operators I displayed several slides ago, uh, are numerically small in the 3D IC model. And this is helpful for resumming their effects and understanding their contributions to other anomalous dimensions. OK, so D-disk is simple, and that make th makes things a lot easier and, and more efficient, uh, easier to understand. So the next thing I want to talk about is analytic spin. So let me set the stage for the, the, the problem that is being solved by analyticity and spin. 
let's consider a correlation function in the CFT. In Euclidean signature, all singularities of correlation functions are described by the operator product expansion. The only interesting singularities are coincident point singularities, and we can do the OPE. And furthermore, the OPE gives a way of, it's a convergent expansion, so it lets us compute correlation functions even at separated points. So it's an extremely useful tool. In Lorentzian signature, the situation is different. The OPE in Lorentzian signature is valid when both operators act on the vacuum. So it's really a statement of an equality between states. With the vacuum, if we act with two operators on, on the vacuum, we get a state that can be expanded in terms of states created by a single operator. But it's easy to find situations where you might want to do the OPE because, say, some space-time interval is going to zero, but you're not allowed because the two operators don't, work, don't act on the vacuum. And uh, perhaps the simplest and also uh, an extremely important example of this is the Reggie limit. And this picture appeared in uh, Tom's talk, but I'll review it uh, again in this context. So the, in the Reggie limit, this is a Penrose diagram for Minkowski space. We have four operators, and they're each approaching the tips of these Rindler wedges. This is the position space version of high energy scattering. And the way you get to it is by taking one and two and boosting them a lot relative to three and four. And the physical picture here is that operators one and three create excitations that move towards the center of uh, Minkowski space. They scatter in some way and then are measured by two and four. And because these operators are becoming light from each other, the relevant energies in the scattering process are becoming large. So uh, this interval between one and two is going to zero, so we might want to use the OPE, but we're not allowed to do it. The reason is that the time-ordered four-point function is not equal to any Whiteman function where one and two both act in the vacuum. So for example, it is equal to this Whiteman function, but here one and two are stuck between three and four, and we can't use the OPE. Um, and the way the failure of the OPE manifests itself uh, is um, it comes from the contribution of large spin states in the one in the one two channel. And we'll, so so uh, right. So the statement is that large spin states in the one two OPE spoil your attempt to go to the Reggie regime. So let me explain uh, the relationship between analyticity and spin and the Reggie limit using uh, a toy model. So uh, consider an amplitude that's a function of a single variable w, which we can think of as e to the i theta. Um, and so real theta will be Euclidean. So when w is on the unit circle, we'll think of that as Euclidean kinematics. And let's suppose that this amplitude is bounded in the Reggie limit. So Reggie limit, the Reggie limit is some kind of Lorentzian configuration where we take w to infinity. So that corresponds to a large boost, which is like theta becoming large and complex. Suppose the amplitude is bounded uh, in some way in this limit. And let's suppose that the amplitude is analytic outside of a cut from 1 to infinity. And furthermore, it has some partial wave decomposition. Now, this partial wave decomposition here is naively in tension with boundedness in the Reggie limit. The partial wave decomposition includes a sum over arbitrarily large spins, but that sum somehow has to behave nicely at large w. OK, so starting from the partial wave decomposition, we can immediately write down a Euclidean inversion formula, which is just uh, Cauchy's integral formula. Um, and the way to go from the Euclidean inversion formula to the Lorentzian inversion formula is to just deform the contour into a Lorentzian regime. So we start with an integral over this circle surrounding the origin in the Euclidean inversion formula. We instead deform the contour out towards infinity, so it wraps around the cut. And here, we use the fact that we have boundedness in the Reggie limit to drop the arc at infinity. So dropping the arc at infinity, we're left with an integral just over the cut, in particular an integral of the discontinuity of the amplitude over the cut. And one important difference between these two formulas is that in the Euclidean inversion formula, j has to be an integer. Because we're integrating around the unit circle, if j were not an integer, this factor w to the minus j would not be single valued, and the integral wouldn't make sense. Instead, in the Lorentzian inversion formula, we have an integral over the real axis, and we can perfectly well set j to be whatever we want with no problem. 
So this analyticity in spin is closely connected with boundedness in the Reggie limit. The idea is, suppose we took this sum, and we took the hundredth term in the sum, so w to the 100, and we wiggled its coefficient very, very slightly. Even that slight wiggle completely ruins good behavior in the Reggie limit. So it means we're not allowed to do that slight wiggle. And in fact, all the different partial waves have to be extremely carefully balanced with each other. And that's what analyticity in spin expresses. It expresses the fact that all the partial waves have to fit together into one function, and that expresses the balance between them. So analyticity in spin lets us do something nice. We can now write the amplitude in a way that makes manifest its Reggie behavior. And this is called the Sommerfeld-Watson trick. So what you do is you start with a sum over partial waves, and you write it as a contour integral over these contours encircling integer values of j. And then you use the fact that the partial waves are analytic in spin to deform the contour away from this, away from the blue contour, to the red contour. And in the process of doing that, you might pick up some other poles in this function a of j. And when you do that, you're led to a new expression for the amplitude as an integral over complex spin. So this expression is better than this expression, if you're interested in Reggie physics. And the reason is that this expression involves arbitrarily large positive j. And ar at arbitrarily large positive j, w to the j seemingly behaves really badly. But in this expression, the contour integral over j stays at some bounded real part. So it makes clear that the amplitude is nicely behaved um, at large w. It, its growth is bounded. So there's an extremely similar story in conformal field theory. So in conformal field theory, if you look at the conformal block expansion and you look at the contribution of an operator with spin j, if you continue to the Reggie regime, you get uh, this new special function, a different conformal block with some shifted uh, arguments, with some swapped arguments. And this thing behaves badly at big j and small z. So the Reggie limit is actually z and z bar going to, going to zero in these coordinates. And at big J, you have a problem. So what you have to do is, is sum up these contributions um, in some way. And uh, you can do that by doing an analog of Sommerfeld-Watson uh, resummation in the CFT. And it gives this formula for the correlator in the Reggie limit. And the key point for us is that this formula depends crucially on an analytic continuation of the CFT data in spin. And uh, if you're not convinced that the Reggie limit uh, is important or interesting, you should see Tom's talk. Um, where it, it plays a lot of interesting roles, and this formula appears uh, in many places in these works, uh, in particular in the context of trying to understand bulk scattering at small impact parameter. So Karen Ho's Lorenzian inversion formula justifies conformal Reggie theory in a general CFT. And the story behind it is, is completely parallels the story that I told in the last few slides. You derive the inversion formula by starting with the Euclidean inversion formula and deforming the contour into Lorenzian kinematics. Um, when you do that, you need to use the fact that the four-point function is bounded in Lorenzian kinematics. And that is a consequence of um, part of the chaos bound. So it's not the full chaos bound. It's sort of the first half of the chaos bound. It gives you boundedness in Reggie kinematics, and that's enough to justify the inversion formula. And this, this whole story might look familiar to some of you, again, who've studied the SYK model. Um, this is the exact same thing that you do to describe the chaos limit in one-dimensional and two-dimensional SYK. OK, so this all leads to the question, what on earth does uh, non-integer spin actually mean? What, what is it supposed to mean? Um, so one confusing thing is the notion that the operators, that the uh, CFT data should be analytically continued in spin. But it's not clear how to continue a local operator in spin. And in fact, there's a big problem with trying to continue a local operator in spin, which is that one can easily prove that continuous spin operators must kill the vacuum. The reason is that the possible states uh, in a CFT with positive energy have been classified by Mac, and they all have integer spin, familiar integer spin. So a continuous spin operator would, if it didn't kill the vacuum, it would create a continuous spin state, and that would clash with positive energy. So they have to kill the vacuum. But on the other hand, local operators certainly do not kill the vacuum. For example, see Edwards' talk. Um, so in fact, the only way to get around this, um, so this shows that you just cannot continue local operators in spin. It doesn't make sense. 
The correct thing to do turns out to be to analytically continue the integral of a local operator along a null line. So O sub j, a local operator, can't be analytically continued in spin. But this thing can. And one of its key properties is that this always kills the vacuum. So this kills the vacuum and is therefore a candidate for something that can be analytically continued. And uh, we call this integral over a null line the light transform um, because uh, uh, it has some nice properties under conformal transformations and it's useful to give it a name. So the claim is that the light transforms of local operators can be analytically continued in J. And when you do this, you're led to some kind of light ray operator. At integer values of J, the light ray operator is equal to the light transform of a familiar local operator. At non-integer values of J, it's something new. And you can construct explicitly these light ray operators as a kind of bilocal integral of local operators over a null line. And Tom had a, uh, showed a formula like this in his slides. So the point of all of this is that the analytically continued CFT data coming out of the inversion formula uh, are matrix elements of light ray operators. That's their, that's their role in life. Um, and this perspective gives a new simple proof of the inversion formula and a generalization of it to arbitrary four-point functions. One of the nice things about this formula is that it really encodes in a deficient way a huge amount of information about the CFT. So you can think of it in the context of large spin perturbation theory and the simplicity of D-disk that we talked about before. Um, uh, but another thing that it encodes is the average null energy condition, for example. So the way you get the ANEC from this point of view is you set J equal to two and take a residue at the dimension of the stress sensor and that gives you the average null energy condition. Um, and you have to be looking at, uh, um, uh, it, it comes from positivity of the double commutator. So you use two operators O to form uh, the ANEC operator and you're looking at its matrix elements in some state psi. So this thing encodes the ANEC, but taking residues at other places gives all other OPE data of the theory. So this is a kind of master formula that answers a lot of questions that you might have about, uh, about the theory. If you're interested in a particular operator, then you can relate its data to four-point functions using this formula. Um, and another uh, interpretation of these light ray operators is that the Reggie limit turns out to be an expansion in light ray operators. So this is a generalization of the Sommerfeld-Watson resummation in CFT. Um, and one claim in particular is that the Region and Pomeron, which are some kind of mysterious objects that encode the Regi behavior of the theory, can rigorously be thought of as certainly families of light ray operators. So all of this leads to a really striking new picture of the CFT spectrum that we all of a sudden have to start taking really seriously. Um, so. Uh, the claim is that these light ray operators fit together into some kind of Riemann surface in the delta J plane. At integer values of J, they're light transforms of familiar local operators, but at non-integer values of J, there's some nice, smooth, rigid structure that they all fit together into. And this claim would, would seem uh, a, a little crazy, except we have some beautiful, explicit examples so this is the Riemann surface in n equals four super Yang mills theory at finite coupling coming from integrability. This is in particular for twist two operators. And so this, in this plot here, this is spin versus, uh, versus dimension and it's including both the real part of the dimension and the complex value of the dimension. Um, and there's some uh, big structure here that familiar local operators live up on this branch somewhere. Um, but other parts of this Riemann surface encode other aspects of Lorenzian physics and could have important things to teach us. So there's sort of a new world to explore here. We need to understand what these pictures look like for CFTs. And these pictures are somehow, um, they have an advantage over just the local operator spectrum in that they're more rigid. They're more rigid structures due to analyticity and spin. Okay, so well, with the remaining time, I, I want to mention a, a little bit about things that I uh, uh, 
didn't manage to really cover in detail. Um, one of the things that's happened over the last few years is we're, uh, people are getting better at doing more sophisticated numerical studies involving operators with spin, for example, uh, currents and stress tensors. And there are lots and lots of interesting applications of uh, numerical bootstrap techniques to supersymmetric CFTs, and we'll hear about that in Madalena's talk. Um, we're at a funny situation in the numerical bootstrap where we have an algorithm that works that, that lets us get out information. It's just a question of uh, how long we can run the computers for, how patient we are, and how, uh, um, how much patience we have writing code. Um, but I think uh, we, we should do it. We should work harder to get some more information out of these algorithms that work. Um, maybe we could find faster algorithms or run it on bigger machines. And just increasing the scale of these computations a little bit, I think, could potentially give access to some uh, many interesting theories that we don't have precise information for now. Um, there's also been some other interesting uh, developments in the analytic bootstrap, one of them which I wanted to mention are some bootstrap bounds that can be proved analytically using the algorithm of Rotazzi, Richkov, Tani, and Vicky, but doing it analytically without any computer searches. Um, and currently the way this works is um, in one dimension, uh, looking carefully at the structure of conformal blocks in one dimension and constructing uh, constructing functionals analytically and using them to prove things about the crossing equation. And I think this is a really interesting and promising direction. Um, it might be difficult to analytically prove, uh, analytically reproduce numerical bootstrap bounds on complicated theories like the 3D icing model, um, which has some, where the, where the optimal functional has some extremely complicated structure. I apologize for using the term optimal functional without uh, describing it. Um, but uh, perhaps these kinds of nice, uh, perhaps these kinds of nice techniques could lead to a better numerical analytical hybrid. Uh, for example, we really want to be able to incorporate large spin perturbation theory in some way uh, into the numerical bootstrap to make it so that the computers don't have to work nearly so hard to describe the large spin spectre, sector of the theory. And maybe this could be a way to do it. So uh, another thing that's uh, been happening recently is extending the bootstrap to new settings, um, looking, at, uh, looking at correlators outside of just flat space, um, flat space correlation functions of local operators. Uh, there have been studies of conformal defects, uh, CFTs at finite temperature and CFTs at large charge. And the Lorenzian inversion formula and analyticity and spin and simplicity of the double discontinuity or its analogs uh, are starting to play a big role in these studies. One of the reasons that people hadn't really looked so much at these areas or had found them difficult is that you can't use numerical bootstrap techniques in a lot of these settings. Basically, the positivity conditions on the crossing equations aren't present, so it's not clear what to do. Um, but uh, we now have better analytical tools, and so there's lots of interesting stuff to do, lots of new things to compute. And that's one of the main things that people have been having fun with. OK, so I want to end the talk with some questions. So one important question that's related to many of the others is, can we solve the complete large spin dynamics of a CFT? I talked about double twist operators, but we also saw that you need multi twist operators. And furthermore, you need to understand all these multi twist operators to really apply the inversion formula fully in a non perturbative theory. But on the other hand, all this large spin dynamics is sort of fixed by representation theory. It's kind of coming from properties of the 6J symbol of the conformal group. So maybe we can solve for it. And the ideal situation would be to really solve for the complete large spin dynamics and then factor it out and focus on the, the non-large spin stuff, the interesting stuff at the heart of the crossing equations. And I think that's an important goal. Um, and that goal is related to some of these other questions. For example, can we iterate the inversion formula? And I would argue that these, uh, this story about loops in the bulk is an example of iterating the inversion formula twice. 
You iterate it once to get tree level data. You iterate it again to get loop level data. If we want to get higher loop data, we need to keep iterating it. And that is related to understanding these multi-twist states. Um, so can we do that, and can we compute higher loops in the bulk? Um, so analyticity and spin in CFTs is telling us about the existence of some light ray operators that encode interesting Lorenzian physics. In particular, they describe the Reggie limit of CFTs. And we could ask, what other stuff is there in a CFT? We know there's this Riemann surface now. What, what else is there? Is the Riemann surface the only thing there is? Are there some new types of operators? What Lorenzian physics do they encode? Is there some complete basis of operators? And for example, can we get to other interesting Lorenzian kinematics, like the bulk point limit? Finally, these new types of operators, these light ray operators, these intrinsically Lorenzian operators, uh, are important for describing Lorenzian physics. And as we've seen in several of the talks today, Lorenzian configurations are crucial for understanding many aspects of information theory in, in quantum field theory. So uh, I think there's perhaps a possibility for some fruitful interplay between uh, understanding these Lorenzian kinematics in CFT and understanding um, information theoretic properties of quantum field theories. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that very illuminating talk. Questions? One there. Uh, so I noticed your coefficient functions had the same poles, uh, the C delta j's. They have the same poles as the Mellin transforms. Is there a relationship between the two? Um, yeah, I mean, they're not, uh, they're not precisely related. I mean, you can go back and forth between them. Um, there have been some work on inversion formulas in Mellin space that let you go from the Mellin representation to this C of delta J. I, I think that these uh, poles at double twist locations are kind of, um, they're, they, um, I think um, maybe the main origin of them is coming from the 6J symbol. Um, and Mellon space is sort of, the 6J symbol is telling you about how to take a block and cross it into the other channel. And Mellon space sort of lives halfway between the different channels. And therefore, display, you see the poles of, of uh, it, these types of poles in both channels. That's maybe the best answer I can give. Okay, uh, sorry. One, one more question was your light ray operators. Yes. They're encoding both the block and the shadow block. What role is the shadow block playing in this whole story? Uh, okay, good. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. So um, this, this picture is shadow symmetric. Um, this Riemann surface that we're supposed to think about, it has this shadow symmetry. Um, and so it means that if you can somehow analytically continue from these light ray operators over here into some kind of operator over here. And uh, I think that the operators over here should be thought of as light cone operators. Um, but uh, I don't really have a great understanding of that at this point. Hi. Uh, so uh, this question is maybe a little unfair, but I'll ask it anyway. Just can, I'm curious if you have an answer. Um, so say I gave you a, so say tomorrow I gave you a computer which was, I don't know, a million times faster than anything that you, you have today. Is there, like, is there like a burning question that we want to answer on that computer? Or is it this more just kind of like, you know, we're you know, just exploring to, to see what we find? You know, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I don't really see what the, yeah, I'm just curious if there's some particular goal just that you have in mind. Um, that's a fair question. And the answer depends on, on who you ask. Uh, definitely. I mean, different people are interested in different theories, and some people are interested in finding new theories. Um, I think with a computer a million times faster, we could do a lot better in mapping out the space of CFTs at least allowed by crossing symmetry and unitarity of a few simple four-point functions. Perhaps we could find some new theories, um, which would be great and, and certainly conceptually new. Um, it's, of course, useful to compute data for theories that we know about. Um, to uh, maybe compare to experiment if you care about that sort of thing. Um, 
But uh, yeah, no, I think that's a fair question. Um, and uh, one of the issues is that the uh, numerical bootstrap does make it difficult to access uh, the kinds of regimes in CFT where we really, where we could learn new conceptual questions about things like quantum gravity. So for quantum gravity, we want you know, non-trivial backgrounds, uh, which really means extremely high dimension operators where the spectrum is extremely chaotic, um, and it's not clear what to do from, uh, from the numerical bootstrap point of view. And I guess the hope is that the numerics can give us clues about analytics, which can help us with numerics, which can give us clues about analytics, and we don't know where it will go, but we're going to try to bounce back and forth like Edward's uh, time-like uh, vectors, the uh, Schleider <laughs> theorem. Question there. Since you, since you have some control over the large spin, I was wondering if you could derive something like the analog of the curve bound from CFTs. So if you look at states with high energy, the, uh, an angular momentum, the angular momentum has an upper bound uh, given by the energy. Is, is that something that you can get a handle on from, from the spectrum? Um, that's an extremely interesting question. I don't know how to do it because the type of control that we have over large spin are for particular types of objects. So we can describe uh, two black holes that are rotating around each other at some very large distance, but not a single black hole that's, that's spinning. Uh, I mean, there's been some, I think the, the, perhaps the correct setting for this is understanding effective field theories for different regimes of the CFT spectrum, the, the type of stuff that, um, that uh, these, um, Sorry, uh, let's see here. These types of authors have been working on. Um, there's been some progress in connecting effective field theories for extreme parts of the spectrum with um, more traditional uh, bootstrap constraints on four-point functions. And I think that might be the right setting for answering that question, but I don't know how to do it. Any more questions? Okay, uh, if not, let's thank uh, David once again. So our next speaker is Madalena Limos uh, from DAISY Hamburg. And uh, she'll be talking about bootstrapping and equal to theories in four. Okay. Okay. Uh, first, I would like to start by um, thanking the organizers for putting together such a wonderful workshop and for giving me this great opportunity to talk here. I. I uh, want to tell you today about the bootstrap program applied to superconformal field theories in four dimensions and with more than minimal supersymmetry. Uh, I will actually focus mostly on theories with n equals 2 supersymmetry. And this is based on work with uh, various subsets of this great set of people. So by now, we've all seen this plot many times. Uh, that kind of captures the great success of the bootstrap program for 3D easing model. We're really just leveraging uh, symmetries and imposing consistency conditions with very minimal spectral assumptions. One has obtained the best uh, estimates for the critical exponent of the 3D easing model. And after seeing all these results and all the nice results that we just showed in his talk, we get very excited and we want to know, well, what other series can we solve? What would be the 3D easing model if I'm interested in four-dimensional series? And let me actually put supersymmetry to have a bit more of a constraint on things. So what would be the theory I could hope to reach numerically if I want to consider, let's say, four-dimensional n equals two superform field theories? So uh, to get to answer that, let me start by taking a step back and reminding you of what our goals and hopes and dreams. So a very ambitious question that we would like to answer is what is the space of consistent uh, four-dimensional superconformal field series? As Clay said, we believe we have the answer for maximal, maximally supersymmetric series. We think n equals 4 superning mills is all there is. Of course, it would be very nice to prove that there are no exotic series, but we are a bit happy 
But the minute you go to half is maximal supersymmetry, then there's a vast zoo of theory, and this catalog keeps on growing, as we saw in Philip's talk. And then, uh, recently, we were given kind of an in-between case, n equals 3 series, which we hope are more constrained by symmetry, but still we are not there, we are far from a complete catalog. So this is a very ambitious goal, of course, but one could hope that at least let's start by delimitating the space of series. Let's just start by exploring the boundaries of this space, and maybe this will help answer the question of what is the 3D easing model, what series can we hope to be within reach easily. And this takes me to the other goal, which is can we actually start solving series? And I will clarify what I mean by solve in a minute. And in this talk, I will focus on what I would consider the simplest Argyris Douglas theory, and that maybe this theory is, would be one of the easing models for, for the n equals 2 SCFTs. And this is actually the, also the theory that J1 considered the simplest in interacting n equals 2 SCFT. So uh, let me very quickly review uh, from David's talk. When I say solve a theory, we are taking this approach that the conformal field theory is defined by the set of all local operators and their correlation functions. And as David said, in the CFT, we have this very nice thing that the operator product expansion has a finite radius of convergence. And so we can use it to reduce down any correlation function. And so the OP allows you to replace this information by the spectrum of all local operators on all of these numbers, these three-point couplings that appear here. And of course, we want to use symmetries as much as possible, so we want to organize our operators in the representations of the conformal algebra. And so this sum here would run over primaries, and the contribution of conformal descendants is totally fixed by symmetry, and it's hidden in this dot, dot, dot. Of course, this data is strongly constrained, and this has been the what has led to all these nice results. And this is constrained by unitarity and by demanding that this operator product algebra is associative. If I say three operators, it shouldn't matter which order I decide to do the OP first. And this translates into the statement of crossing symmetry for all, all four-point functions in the theory, which are really the equations we want to study and that David has been describing in his talk. So now let me add supersymmetry. Now, what will happen is that we have a bigger symmetry. So, of course, we want to organize our operators in representations of this bigger symmetry. And supercharges really relate various conformal families together. And so we want to go from conformal blocks to superconformal blocks. And OK, you could complain that this is just a finite reorganization of an infinite set of data, the whole spectrum of operators and the OP coefficients, and still with an infinite number of crossing equations to solve. But you can ask if there is a solvable subsector of these equations, at least if you have enough supersymmetry. And the answer is, in four dimensions, yes, if you have n equals 2 or more. And this is a statement that there is a subsector of four-dimensional n equals 2 SCFTs that is captured by two-dimensional chiral algebra, by which I mean just the left-moving part of a two-dimensional CFT. And this is the chiral algebra that various people have referred to in previous talks. So uh, I will not uh, describe to you how to construct it, but the point is that you have a map between four-dimensional quantities, between four-dimensional n equals 2 SCFT and two-dimensional chiral algebras. And in particular, if you have a four-dimensional series with n equals 2 supersymmetry, then you will have an SU2R symmetry, and there will be an SU2R current. And this, under this map, this operator maps onto the stress tensor in two dimensions. This is perhaps not so surprising because, because of supersymmetry, the SU2R current sits precisely in the same multiple as the stress tensor multiple. So you can go between them by acting with the supercharges. So sorry, now here, I was just taking n equals 2 supersymmetry, and we started by something supersymmetric in four dimensions. And under this map, we go down to 2D, but there is no supersymmetry left. Of course, if you had started with something that was supersymmetric to begin with, that, sorry, that had more supersymmetry than equals 2 in four dimensions, then you would have some leftover supersymmetry in two dimensions. And in this case, more operators in the superstress tensor multiplet make it to this chiral algebra. And uh, you would end up in 2D with the superstress tensor. 
So now let me uh, show you what we can infer from uh, this by making a trivial statement in two dimensions. So if I have a four-dimensional n equals two SCFT that is interacting, I know it will have a stress tensor supermultiplet. So this guy is always there. And under this map, it will always give me a two-dimensional stress tensor. But now a trivial statement in 2D is that the four-point function of this two-dimensional stress tensor is completely fixed in terms of the central charge. We can just look it up. It's fixed by word identities. And here, the central charge, I uh, recall, that is a, a two-point function of the stress tensor. But also by this map, this central charge is related to the four-dimensional central charge, which again is a two-point function of the stress tensor, like so. And so I know the whole four-point function in 2D. Let me keep making trivial statements. So I will now do a block decomposition in 2D of this four-point function. And doing so, I will read off a bunch of two-dimensional OP coefficients. So, so far, there was nothing really special. These, oper these OP coefficients are not constrained in an obvious way by unitarity. The two-dimensional series is not unitary. But now, when I want to lift these two-dimensional quantities to four dimensions, which I can do, modulus some assumptions, I get some OP coefficients in four dimensions that are constrained by unitarity. And in particular, they uh, they're square. They should be real, so their square should be positive. And so this will give rise to new unitarity bounds. So let me show you the result. If you take 4d n equals 4 SCFTs, then the central charge, which in 4n equals 4 is actually also equal to the anomaly coefficient, has to be greater than 3 over 4, which is we recognize as the central charge of n equals 4 superior meals with gauge group SU2. Now, if you go to n equals 3, we find a similar bound, 13 over 24, which sits there. And this, so the bound itself, it just comes from interpreting a two-dimensional OP coefficient in four dimensions. But we can do more. We can actually look at the two-dimensional operators and reinterpret them in four dimensions. And by doing so, we see that there, there can be no interacting series corresponding to the series that would have this central charge. And so that's why there's a little empty dot there. So this is a strict inequality. And actually, the simplest known n equals 3 CFT, the one with the smallest central charge that is non-trivially an n equals 3 CFT, sits all the way here. OK, so uh, now let me finally go down to n equals 2. And this is the bound we also saw in J1's talk of 11 over 30 that is saturated by an Argyris Douglas theory. And this is the theory that we would call the simplest Argyris Douglas theory. It has the smallest possible central charge. So let's now focus on this theory because it sits in such a special place that this would be a candidate for a theory we can actually reach numerically. This could be the one analog of the 3D easing model in four dimensions for n equals two series. So this is exactly the theory J1 described in his talk. So I'm going to quickly review. So these series were originally obtained by Agiris and Douglas on the Coulomb branch of 4D n equals to Susie Gage series with gauge group SU3. They were very recently given an n equals 1 Lagrangian description, as we heard in J1's talk. Uh, but they are really still strongly coupled isolated CFTs, so there's no marginal deformation, there's no parameter we can tune to go on compute correlation functions if we want to. But for, that, that for us, that shouldn't matter. This is just another superformal field theory. And what's more, it's actually a very simple one in the sense that it has a very low central charge. It also has the lowest A anomaly coefficient among all known uh, interacting n equals two SCFTs. And Another way it is simple is that its chiral algebra has been conjectured to be the Li Yang minimal model. So this is the theory I will now focus on and try to reach to numerically. And our tools are exactly the ones David just described. The numerical bootstrap and the light cone bootstrap by making use actually of the Lorentzian inversion formula of Karen Hua. So uh, how should we approach this theory? So there are a few things we know about it for, from its original construction. For example, we know it has a 4dn equals 2 chiral operator that has this particular dimension, which we note is a very small number, which uh, in practice is very good for the numerical bootstrap. 
And so this is an N equals to chiral operator. I recall that that's an operator that is killed by all supercharges of one chirality. And because of that, its U1R charge is fixed in terms of CV dimension. So it has a non-trivial U1R charge. And so the simplest four-point function I can consider is two of these guys and uh, two of its conjugates. So this is what we will focus on, and this is how we will try to attack this theory. So to set it up, now we will have two different OP channels. We can take the OP between these two guys, like that, or between the operator and its conjugate. And this is the channel where we will see the identity and the superstress tensor multiple being exchanged. The only thing we need to do to apply the bootstrap machinery is we need to go from conformal blocks to super conformal blocks, but they were already computed. They're actually only relevant in this particular channel here. So what's the first question we want to ask the bootstrap? Well, we saw 11 over 30 was the minimal possible central charge for an interacting SCFT. This came from one particular correlator. It came from the stress tensor correlator. Does this correlator also know about this fact or not? To do that, let me show you a bound, a lower bound on the central charge. And here is how good we're making our numerics. So recall that we're doing when we're studying the crossing equations numerically, is we're basically tailor expanding the crossing equations around the point. And these are basically how many uh, terms we keep in the tailor expansion. And our best result is that c has to be greater or equal than this number here, which is still a little bit far from 11 over 30. You can try to extrapolate a little. Will it converge to that number or not? Well, maybe. But regardless, it is not so far, so there's not much room to different solutions to the crossing equations in between. And we can also tune C to the desired value. So let me show you what happens there. Let's actually focus now on the channel where I take the OP between two of these n equals to chiral operators. There appears an operator which I'm calling phi square because its dimension is protected to be twice that of the phi. It's protected by supersymmetry. It's actually another n equals to chiral operator. But its OP coefficient is not, so it's not known today. So we can ask the bootstrap, what can you tell us about this OP coefficient? How is it constrained? And uh, we find this exclusion curve. So this is the OP coefficient. These painted regions are excluded, and the OP coefficients have to live inside this white triangle as we vary the central charge. So here is the minimum allowed central charge, and here there is a unique solution, then the, the OP coefficient is just pinned down to that number. But uh, here, at this dashed line, this is 11 over 30, this is where our theory lives. And we are still constraining it to line between these two numbers, so it's very much constrained numerically already with, a f with finite numerics. So um, let's look more down this OP. There are other operators, actually, whose dimensions are actually fixed in the same way, but OP coefficients are unknown. So we can play the same game. Let's, they are now they are like spinning versions of this guy. So they have spin. So let's bound their OP coefficients as we, for various spins, all the way from spin 20 to spin 0, which is the guy I just showed you. And now we find that the OP coefficients have to live in between these red uh, intervals. And now the reason I'm going for large spin, as is suggested from the uh, inversion formula that we heard about just now, is that we can hope to match this by using the inversion formula for this OP, the phi phi OP. Actually, in this case, it's just the same as the bosonic inversion formula. In the other channel, which we also looked at, it's not, but in this case, it is. So it's only guaranteed to be valid for spin greater than 1. Of course, it could work better. And uh, we will be feeding in only the low twist operators. Actually, the only input we'll be putting in is just the identity and the stress tensor. These are the two OP coefficients we know for sure, uh, exactly. And so we're only guaranteed to get good answers for large spin. So we're getting an approximation that is good for large spin. So, so 
this is the approximation we get, this dashed blue line here. Uh, and you see it goes very nicely, matched very nicely with the numerical bound, and it goes in between the allowed region all the way down to spin 4. To spin 2, it's actually outside, but regardless, this was an approximation that should only work for a very large spin. We did really put very little input, just the first approximation you could really do. And also, it's not so far off for spin 0. But this... Uh, Red intervals, these are really rigorous bounds for these Arteria's Douglas series. The OP coefficients must be inside these, these tiny intervals here that we have. And then we are just approximating them analytically with very minimal input, and we're already finding a nice match. So this is reason to hope that uh, this Arteria's Douglas series could be within reach of the numerical bootstrap. So now let me take a step back and see uh, if we just got lucky with this one or if there are other series we could hope to uh, reach numerically. So when I started, I showed you this uh, line, which uh, is a very rough uh, picture of the space of four-dimensional n equals to SCFTs. I was just projecting them all down to an axis just parameterized by the central charge. So I would like now to take a finer uh, look at this space of series. So let's also organize series by their flavor symmetry. And just like here, we had C, which was a two-point function of the stress tensor. If we have a series with a flavor symmetry, it will have a flavor current. And the two-point function of that flavor current is also a meaningful uh, quantity to consider. And so let's refine our uh, view of the space of series by uh, adding an extra axis to this plot, by looking also at k. And for concreteness, let me focus on series with n equals uh, with SU2 flavor symmetry. So here I'm kind of taking a slice of the space of series, parameterized by the central charge and by the two-point function of the flavor current. And I've sprinkled in some of the known uh, theories. So now let's go back to the chiral algebra and see what it can teach us about the space of these theories. So we have a flavor symmetry, so we will have a flavor current that will sit in some multiple with many other operators. And one of these operators actually makes it under this map. And so we can again compute its four-point function in 2D it will give just a fine cut smoothie current algebras in 2D, so we can just fix again its four-point function completely. And we can do the same, get two-dimensional OP coefficients, lift them to four dimensions, and see what that teaches us. And that, will, that gives this exclusion curve here. All of this is uh, ruled out with some minimal assumptions that we, need, we are focusing on interacting series, and we are also demanding that there is a unique stress tensor. But this is still not good enough, because there could be degeneracies in the OP. We are looking at OP coefficients, but there could be various operators that are exchanged in this OP that have the same quantum numbers and look at the same. And so actually what we are looking at is a sum of OP coefficients squared. This is still positive, so the bounds are still good, but this is not the best we can do. So we want to try to lift these degeneracies a bit somehow. So to do that, let's also look at the stress tensor four-point function that we had before. Some of these operators will also be exchanged there, but not all. So we use this to lift these ambiguities, to distinguish between these operators. And then the bound we get is this blue region here. And again, there is an Argyris Douglas here that sits in this uh, corner, in this special point here. Uh, you can ask for each other flavor groups. Does such a thing happen? How does the plot look if I change the flavor group? And actually, this intersection, this kind of corner, only happens if you have flavor symmetry SU2, SU3. And these are Argyris Douglas series again, SO8. And this is just uh, N equals 2 superconformal QCD. E67, E8, which are the Minahan and Mashansky series, and these two series with these flavor symmetries that are not known to exist. So uh, let me conclude. Uh, I've shown you constraints on the simplest Argyris-Douglas theory that 
seems to be within reach of the numerical bootstrap. Of course, we want to push it further and see if we can actually start solving it, putting in more uh, constraints, more correlators. But it seems to be within reach. But now there is uh, maybe another way to look at the other uh, strongly coupled theories, the ones that sit in the corners of these exclusion curves. So now we would have to look at the mixed system, the system that produced this bound. We would look, need to look at the system with stress tensors and flavor currents. And maybe we could even get stronger constraints, numerical constraints on this space of series, this plot that I just showed you, because there are still empty regions in that plot. For this, a necessary ingredient is, of course, the stress tensor uh, superconformal blocks, which are not known yet. And actually, one thing to point out is that this bound that I just showed you, they did not come from the superprimary of the stress tensor multiplet. They came from the SU2R current that lives somehow below. It's a super descendant. And so maybe we would to actually reach them, maybe we do need to compute the whole super block. And in fact, to get this block, this bound for n equals, through S, n equals 3 SCFTs, we didn't need uh, the full super block for two dimensional stress tensors, not just the super primary one. Here, maybe uh, to, to help with these computations, maybe something along the way shifting operators would help. And finally, it's very unsatisfactory that this bound is a strict inequality and that the smallest series we know actually has a central charge bigger than n equals 4 super young mills. So it leaves the question, what is the smallest n equals 3 series? Why can't we push this bound further? And is there actually something between this bound and n equals 4? Or is the smallest n equals 3 series really bigger than n equals 4 as far as C is concerned? And A, because there is. So that's it. Thank you. One thing you'd like to know, or I'd like to know, is whether there are um, uh, n equals two conformal field theories with no uh, Coulomb branches. Is there a, a way that the bootstrap could be used to answer a question like that? Right, we usually do it the other way around. We say, let's assume we know this, and can, what can we find? So I guess you need to find some four-point function of an operator you would expect to be generically present in a series that could exchange the Coulomb branch one, which sounds uh, maybe a bit hard, but at least not the canonical universal operators, not exchanging stress tensors or flavor currents or Higgs branch operators. She. Um, I have a related question. So uh, previously, a lot of work on this subject is based on the moduli space of vacua, and uh, which are naturally connected to large charge operators. Um, have, you are discussing small charge operators. Do you have some ideas on how to connect the two? Right. So here, small charge operators, the, the Coulomb branch operators we take are have low dimension and so low charge, which is good for the numerical uh, bootstrap. Yeah, but I'm saying that the four-point function you are considering only access. It, uh, it only, because I start with something that has a low charge to begin with, which is why it's easier for us to look at it numerically. It's more promising. But there have been these large charge uh, results indeed, and maybe, uh, I don't know, I don't have anything uh, intelligent to say. Any other questions? So, what do you? Yeah, nice talk. Uh, you mentioned on one slide, I think, that you can use some of these techniques for 6D n equals 2, 0. I'm just wondering if you have tried or made any progress in using the same ideas in 6D n equals 1, 0. And I'm particularly interested in the G2 and F4 models you mentioned, which in that context, at least from the F theory construction, are things that would very naturally arise. So it seems that that same number of supersymmetries. Yeah, I haven't looked at 6D 1,0, but people have already uh, done the numerical bootstrap for 6D 1,0. 
and actually I think some of the people are in the audience. So there, there was also some, uh, there were some of the 1,0 1, 1, series that you, you could start seeing numerically, you would reach that the central charges were numerically converging to the right values. Good. So it seems also promising there. Good. And can you just say again what the signal was of the G2 and F4 theories? Oh, these G2 and F4 theories? Yeah. Um, well, they look, the plot for G2 and F4 looks very much similarly to this one. The fact that it sits in this particular point would tell you that its Higgs branch should be the one in the modulo space of G2 of F or F4. Uh, they have not been found. The complete rank one classification of SCFTs has not found anyone that could be these guys. They wouldn't. Uh, so it's not clear whether it, it's not clear just because there is something special happening in the chiral algebra that you should be entitled to feel that there is a four dimensional series. So all the conditions for when does a chiral algebra correspond to a full fledged four dimensional theory is, are not yet completely understood. Thanks. Final question. Okay, if not, uh, let's thank Madlina again. <laughs> Both the speakers. Are you
Uh, all right, uh, welcome back to the uh, second half of the afternoon section. Uh, last couple of years, uh, there has been a beautiful uh, interaction between physics and number theory. Uh, now we're going to have a sweet talk on the subject. The first talk is by Iguchi. Uh, he will talk about introduction to the stringing motion. Oh, do you hear me? I'm sorry, I, I have a little problem with the throat. So if you cannot hear me, I have to do something. Seems OK. OK, so this is uh, an introduction to the story of stringy moonshine phenomenon. Uh, several years ago, by some accident, three of us, uh, myself, uh, Oguri-san, and uh, Hachikawa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, after Purzas. He used to be my student. <laughs> so it so happened that three of us uh, collided and stayed uh, for at the same time for some, some period. And uh, one day we, we didn't quite know what to do. So at the time of the uh, Coffee, I think uh, somebody uh, co coffee and distribute. So at that time, I was, uh, I thought, okay, this is a good chance. I was, uh, I have been long curious about uh, the, this, about the theory I'm, I'm going to explain. Then, uh, at that time, right away, uh, one of us had uh, uh, mass. Uh, mass table, the book of a, of a mass, mass table. And uh, at the very, very end of the book, there was a character formula for M24. So we, we found uh, something strange, but we were sort of a little bit afraid that uh, if we, we say, OK, there, so here is a very strange thing, et cetera, we may, may make a mistake. And so we didn't publish it for a year. And after one year, somehow, again, we three together uh, met each other. Let's see, this was in, uh, I don't remember, but uh, it's okay. So then we decided to go ahead and publish this result. So there is one way, one year delay for, for this, for the discovery. <laughs> so several years ago, We found some curious phenomenon in string theory, appearance of exotic uh, uh, discrete, discrete symmetries in the theory. This is now called as a moonshine phenomenon as is now under intensive study. Today, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to moonshine phenomena, which may possibly play an interesting role in string theory in the future. Before going to the moonshine phenomenon in string theory, let me briefly recall the story of a monstrous moonshine, which is well known. 
uh, Mozilla J function as a Q series expansion. J of Q is equal to one over Q plus 744 plus 1968, 84 Q plus, etc. So Q is the, if I tau, our imaginary tau is positive, and this is invariant under SL to Z transmission, the so called uh, uh, modular J function. <laughs> so it turns out the Q expansion coefficient of the J function, so these uh, six, five long. Long terms, but uh, there is there is a very strange uh, phenomenon taking place. So uh, let's see. What is it? Sasna taking. Nineteen sixty eight eighty four is equal to one plus nineteen sixty eight eighty four eighty three and it is known one nineteen sixty eight eighty three is the representation of monster which is the same on the smallest size. And the next one twenty one forty nine, etc. Twenty one forty nine, etc. Can be decomposed is one plus this number plus the rest. And then this number is again used in the next expansion and, and etc. So we see dimensions of a reducible representation of the monster are in fact given by. Yeah, we see the, in the expansion of the modular J function, I mentioned the irreducible representation monster. So uh, the monster group is the largest discordic discrete group of order 10 to the 53. And the strange relationship between modular form and the largest discrete group as first noted by Kai. Actually, the Mackay's decomposition itself is not quite rigorous because uh, we can always arbitrarily do a, a further uh, decomposition 1968.82 plus 1. And uh, there is actually almost an infinite amount of ambiguity. So somehow we need a principle to fix this. And actually, it turns out that there is a that very simple method. And I think I won't, don't want to spend much spend time on this trick. Uh, Marquis Thompson series. So the original series expansion as defined by Marquis and the slight uh, improvement of the expansion is, is the so called Marquis Thompson series. And if we can uh, fix all the Marquis Thompson series, then there is a unique decomposition. And then whether we can test whether uh, this monster's moonshine phenomenon is uh, true. 
And uh, the phenomenon of Munster's moonshine was discovered, I think, uh, around 1978 or 79, late 70s. And um, more or less, the Munster's moonshine phenomenon has been understood mathematically in the early 1990s using a using the technology of vertex coverage. However, we still don't maybe this depends on who you are, but uh, I tend to feel that we still don't have a very simple physical explanation of the phenomenon of the So the subject today is uh, is a, a stringy moonshine. So this is not quite a uh, moonshine which fits into a string theory scenario or or, or spectrum. But uh, we now seem to have uh, come up with discovered a new stringy type uh, moonshine phenomenon which is uh, uh, quite different from the monstrous moonshine. So we now uh, consider a string theory compactified on a three surface. A three surface is a complex two-dimensional hypercalar manifold and the ubiquitous in string theory. It possesses a C2 holonym and holomorphic proof form. Thus, the string theory on P3 has an N is equal to 4 superconformal symmetry and contains a level 1 of fine C2 symmetry and a central charge, or total central charge C is equal to 6. Now, instead of a uh, modular J function, we consider the elliptic genus of K3 surface. So we had the J function and the Fourier expansion of the Q series. Then instead of J function, we con consider K3 surface. And uh, <laughs> elliptic genus describes the topological invariance of the target manifold and the counter number of BPS states in the series. Using Shibar sheet variable, it is written as as this this way in the Shibar sheet variables. So we have uh, Q to the L zero or Q bar to the L of R. This is a usual formula E to the I H. And uh, minus one to the FL plus FR. So this is a cancellation term. So even number of fermions and odd number of fermions are carries opposite sign. If they are both at the same level, then the number of these states cancel out. And in this formula, the L3 term, sorry, L0 term, <coughs> there is a complete cancellation for the L0 term because uh, there is no, no, uh, no term which with L, L04 in the exponent. So if, if, so if you look at just the uh, right moving part of the theory, right moving part of the theory is only these two terms and they and to call the higher excited states completely cancel and only the ground states survive. 
So the right moving part is sort of trivialized in this dialectic genus. And the left moving part, we have this term. So even if the level of bosonic state and the phenolic state is the same, bosonic state and the phenolic state has a whole opposite sign. So they do not cancel. They adapt in, in a sense. So because of, because of that, the right moving sector, we don't do any computation, just a current state. The left moving sector has an infinite summation. There must be some kind of a trick to do, perform this uh, computation. Actually, at that time, uh, the, the late 1980s, we were trying to compute such an object. And in general, it was not quite possible to compute this. And, but uh, if you consider in particular the case of uh, uh, Lefner point, <coughs> this uh, elliptic genus is a topological quantity. So depending on the position, depending on the, the po position in the modular space, then the, the topological quantities are, uh, doesn't depend on the location on the modular space, but uh, uh, topologically independent quantities uh, do not. So if we can compute the, uh, this quantity, at particular just one point in the uh, modular space of the three surface, that's Good enough. And that is what we, we have done. And uh, well, that was uh, very difficult, but uh, it turns out now it's possible to use this method. And uh, well, EPS state. Uh, if you look, if you uh, read the details of any squad for level K, uh, contains a, level K algebra contains uh, the following term G0, 0, zero is a zero mode, G bar, bar is a right moving, so G0 I bar y, g0, bar star j. Form theta is equal to l0 bar minus k over 2. Then the left hand, hand side of this equation is g, g star, g star g. So this is a positive difference. So if the left hand side is, is equal to zero, there's zero bar, is equal to k over two, k over four, then uh, then we have a state which is annihilated by all these supercharges. So this is uh, the BPS state. So, uh, but now there is actually there is a better argument. In general, it's difficult to compute the elliptic genus. However, we are able to compute it by making use of Kepner bundles. And uh, the result is uh, elliptic genus of K3 is written as a sum of the ratios of theta function. And uh, when z is close to particular values, so z is equal to zero, 
that's z is equal to 24, and this is the Euler number, and the z is equal to one half. 16 is the so-called Hertzberg uh, index, and the z is equal to one plus tau over two is two times q to the minus one half. This two is the number of fermion zero modes. It is known mathematic, from mathematics textbooks. The elliptic genus of a complex d dimensional manifold is a Jacobi form of weight zero index d over two. When d is equal to two, space of Jacobi form is one-dimensional and given by the bubble form. Jacobi form is a, a combined idea of the elliptic function and the modular function and uh, the, tra the transmission of the R variable and the S variable, they mix into each other. I think I'm going too, too slow. Uh, so, in this situation, n is equal to four superconformal algebra. Uh, high state states are parameterized by two parameters, h and l. So, L0 eigenvalue of L0 is h, eigenvalue of J03 is l. And the theory possesses two different types of relationships, EPS and non EPS. In the case of k is equal to 1, there are representations. BPS representation h is equal to quarter, non BPS representation. So, this is, we are working in the, the, the Ramon sector of the theory. So, h is equal to quarter is the lowest energy of the system. Then, non BPS uh, representation h is supposed to be. Uh, bigger than code, and uh, there is the spin degree of freedom. The character of representation is given by this form. <laughs> and uh, the, what we want to use is uh, uh, the ellipse the uh, character functions of various representation. Uh, so the first one is a character function of uh, uh, the ground state, h is equal to one quarter, and spin zero, l is equal to zero. And uh, so here we have theta one squared over eta cube. formula in the middle, and times mu, mu has an infinite summation, and uh, and, it, and this is a BPS representation, this is the, the character of the BPS representation, and if you look at this one, this is, is a character of non-BPS representation, Non BPS representation character. If you look, if you compare, this is just the same as the free field theory. The character of the free field theory and uh, uh, q to the h minus uh, three of a h is bigger than quarter. That is q the exponent is bigger than quarter. So. So this non-BPS representation is just the ordinary free fields. But in the case of uh, non-BPS, sorry, BPS representation, we have a very different structure. We have this complicated function mu. And this function mu played a crucial role in this story. And uh, uh, what is wrong with this function? It turns out, under modular transformation, 
this it doesn't behave like a modular function. And uh, uh, it also doesn't transform like the elliptic function. And so this is uh, a bro broken. So this is a re representation. So function mu mu z power is a typical example of the so-called mock theta function, log sum or up function. Mock theta function looks like theta function, but they have anomalous modular transformation laws are difficult to handle. Recently, there has been a development in understanding the nature of mock theta function. With its famous mathematician. He has introduced a method of regularization, which is similar to those used in physics and improved the modular property of mock theta functions so that they transform as analytic Jacobi forms. It is possible to derive the following identities. So the left hand side is L is equal to zero is a ground state. So this is the uh, EPS character. EPS character is now express possible this is to express as in the right hand side. So mu2, mu3, mu4 is defined as a specialized function, specialized mu function as a specialized value of z. Then if we combine, if we sum of the both sides, If you take the sum of these and uh, divide by four, so this is the k 3 units. And uh, uh, this object is the sum of mu at special values of z. Okay, so together we can write the uh, this is uh, the function which comes from the mu, mu dependent. And this is the uh, uh, spin zero component. Okay. So in the end, we can write down uh, this formula. So we can now make, uh, make an analogy. So we, let's imagine this is a J function. And uh, let's ignore this. And let's consider this as a, a Fourier series. And so then this is a Fourier quotient. And so we, we have a Fourier quotient for each Fourier mode, 45 to 31, et cetera. Then there was a surprise. Uh, if you look at the uh, mathematical table, 45 and 231, 770, 990, etc., have something special with uh, the group 10M24. So the, the uh, dimensional reduced representation of my C group M34 as uh, dimensions 45, 231, 77, 990, et cetera. So you see 45 is here, 231 is here, 77 is here. 
I don't know it's called. Saturday nine fifteen. It's this and the three zero eight four three. Some 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 the M thirty four one one seven seven one two zero two four five three one three five five four four five seven nine six one zero three nine three nine five. So, so this is, I'm sorry, I think I will finish in a few minutes. So this is the analogy. So in the case of uh, uh, monstrous moonshine, we have just a single variable, Q or Z. Uh, so, sorry, oh, I should say. So function J had, had a, a, a series, very series expansion with single variable q to the n. And in this case, we have two variables, z and r. But if you look at this, that part, the summation is over, over n. So, so that corresponds to the uh, uh, summation of by n of the monster moonshine case. So it's so there is a a complete sort of matching between this new type of uh, a stringy string theoretic moonshine uh, phenomenon, which is seems quite uh, Analogous to the machine monsters moonshine. So ah, and we also have to fix the ambiguity of the expansion, and this has been has been done. So the fact that the, this uh, factorization takes place is a mathematical uh, theory. So in the case of uh, uh, Masu group M24, it seems the, this expansion is okay, it's true. And uh, there has been uh, uh, efforts to expand, extend these examples into more different examples. And uh, we are going to hear from uh, about these uh, more uh, moonshine, you know. So thank you very much. Okay, we, now we see the magic appearance of M24. Uh, is any question? Okay, next thanks for speaker then.
Okay, now it's our second talk on Mengxian by, by Jeffrey Harvey. Uh, uh, we'll have more Mengxian. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the work I'm going to be describing is work with my collaborators who are shown here, Miranda Ching, John Duncan, and Brandon Rehon, and is contained in the papers that I've listed here. Um, and one that I'm hoping at least partly will appear in 2018, but has been promised for some time. All of this work really is an outgrowth of the work that was just discussed by Oguchi Sensei, which uh, really started a new um, development in Moonshine. So like everybody else, I would like to offer some thanks uh, to the organizers for a very stimulating and very well-run meeting, to the program committee for inviting me to speak, but I'm not sure who to thank for the fact that the full moon in Okinawa happened about two hours ago. So a few days ago as I was preparing this talk, as people that work on moonshine always do, we try to keep track of the phase of the moon, and it said that the full moon would be on June 28th at 1.53, so literally about three hours ago. So just so that we know what we're talking about, uh, in an eclipse of the sun by the moon, the darkest part of the shadow is called the umbra. There's a lighter part outside called the penumbra. And I'm going to be talking about umbral and penumbral moonshine. The penumbra is larger than the umbra, it has less shadow, and it kind of lies next to it. And all of those are going to be true of penumbral moonshine. So, uh, as our chairman said, this is really, uh, I, and I agree, that moonshine really is part of a story of trying to connect number theory to physics in a deeper way. And one of the central objects, both in string theory and in, in the mathematics of number theory, are modular forms, essentially because modular forms count things, and number theory is about counting. And in string theory, there are many things that we would like to count. So the states of the open bosonic string are famously counted by 1 over the Dedekind eta function to the 24th power. This is a weight minus 12 form, modular form. The little exclamation point indicates that it uh, is what's called a weakly holomorphic form, meaning it has some negative powers of q in its expansion. Uh, the points in the eight, E8 eight root lattice are famously counted by this theta function, which is a weight 4 modular form. And was just explained, the elliptic genus of K3 is a kind of modular form. It's actually called a Jacobi form. And it counts BPS states if you look at type 2 string theory on K3 times S1. So sometimes, in addition to counting BPS states, uh, in conformal field theories, for example, these states being counted also live in a vector space, which transform under some representation of a finite group G. They form a module for G. And we then often say informally that the modular form exhibits moonshine for G because these coefficients in the modular form are then going to have a decomposition into dimensions of irreducible representations of the group G. But moonshine should be more than that. If that was all that moonshine was, then there are an infinite number of examples. You can take any finite group, I think, and, and make it as the automorphism group of some lattice. If you have a lattice, you can make a lattice VOA, or in other words, you can make a conformal field theory of bosons that live on that lattice, and the, the theta function for that, or the partition function for that theory, will exhibit moonshine for the automorphism group of the lattice. That's too easy, it's too boring. Moonshine should be, well, special, exceptional, finite in number, sporadic, mysterious. I don't want to make that part of the definition, because if it always remained mysterious, we would never understand it but um, it should certainly be special in some way. So, in moonshine, as we've heard, and as is true in monstrous moonshine, many of the same forms and techniques uh, that appear in conformal field theory and in black hole counting uh, arise in the study of moonshine. And we therefore hope that maybe we will learn something about string theory, because it really is one of the open mysteries in string theory to explain the origin of these compactifications and formal field theories that have these incredibly large symmetry groups. It's really strange that it occurs. So I'll discuss two kinds of moonshine that have these properties of being excep exceptional, special, finite in number. One is umbral moonshine, which started with the uh, observation that was just explained that related the elliptic genus of K3 to the representation theory of M24. 
This was uh, generalized to other Jacobi forms and groups and classified by Niemeyer lattices uh, in two of the papers that I cited that were done with Miranda Chang and John Duncan. And the other example that I'm going to be talking about is penumbral moonshine. This is the work that's in progress. But it started uh, with a paper that I wrote with Brandon Rehun on what I called Thompson moonshine. And it's been generalized to other skew holomorphic Jacobi forms, something that I will discuss as I go on. So one common element in, all, in both of these kinds of moonshine and in monstrous moonshine, which provides a rigidity which makes the number of examples finite in number, is the idea of a genus zero surface and a genus zero subgroup of SL2R. So we're all familiar with the modular group SL2Z. If this uh, integer C is equal to zero mod N, this defines a, a subgroup called gamma naught N. And you can form a larger group, which is not in the modular group, but it is in SL2R by adjoining what are called Atkin laner involutions. And there's one of these for every exact divisor of n. So an exact divisor is a divisor that's relatively prime to n mod e. So for example, if you have 12, 3 is an exact divisor between, because 3 is relatively prime to 12 over 3, which is 4. But 2 is not an exact divisor of 12 because 2 is not relatively prime to 6. The only one of these other than some notation that I really am going to have to focus on is what's called the Fricke involution, which is n itself. So this corresponds to taking tau to minus 1 over n tau. So if there's a subgroup of SL2R that contains this Fricke involution and gamma naught n, we will say that that is a Fricke subgroup. And if it doesn't, it's non-Fricke. I don't know if it's Fricke or Fricke, but anyway, Fricke, I think. Um, so these genus zero subgroups are called genus zero because if you take the upper half plane and divide by the action of that subgroup of SL2R, you get a surface which when you add a finite number of points corresponding to these cuspy points, um, can be mapped to the Riemann sphere of genus zero by a function that's often called the Haupt module and, which occur, and these functions occur uh, very often in monstrous moonshine. So often this is drawn for the fundamental domain of the modular group. Here I've drawn you the picture for gamma naught two corresponding to n equals two without adding any extra things. But all of the groups that I'm going to be talking about are these genus zero groups that define what are called modular surfaces of genus zero. So these groups govern all the twists and twines, which I'll define, that appear in monstrous moonshine. And they also classify the cases of umbral and penumbral moonshine. So in monstrous moonshine, this is a conformal field theory, C equals 24, no dimension one operators, 196883 primary dimension two operators plus the stress tensor. If you take the monster acts as an automorphism group of this theory, and if you take two elements of the monster that commute, in other words, it corresponds to putting boundary conditions on the two torus, which are classified by pi 1 of T2, uh, then you can define a path integral on the torus with modular parameter tau, where you put boundary conditions by the element h in the Euclidean time direction and by g in the space direction. And these have now been called twists and twines to keep them separate. And these uh, twisted and twined versions of the partition function have the interpretation of a trace over a twisted Hilbert space with an insertion of h, q to the l naught minus c over 24. So in monstrous moonshine, as it first appeared in the paper by Conway and Norton, they uh, identified all of these partition functions with g, the identity, so all the twined ones, for each of the, this depends only on the conjugacy class of h. They uh, defined all of those and conjectured that uh, these were all genus zero. Um, that was eventually proved by Borchards. And in this more general case, where you look at twists and twines, um, there were some early cases worked out by Larissa Queen. Uh, Norton made a general conjecture that these were all genus zero, and that conjecture has been proved recently by Scott Carnahan. 
One of the aspects of this that was pointed out very early on is that the group P plus P, so that means gamma naught P plus you add this Frick involution to get a subgroup of SL2R, is genus zero precisely when P is one of the primes dividing the order of the monster, which is a you know, finite list of now special primes. So uh, this is not a moon, but it's a moon-like object. So umbral moonshine. Uh, we started with uh, this amazing observation that there's a connection between M24 and the elliptic genus of K3. And that expanded to a uh, generalization where instead of that one example, there are actually 23 examples uh, labeled by Niemeyer lattices called umbral moonshine. And uh, Miranda and John and I were able to show that you could take each Niemeyer lattice, so these are even self-dual rank 24 lattices, and the group of umbral moonshine is determined by the automorphism group of that lattice. And you could also use the data of the roots of the lattice to produce a uh, weight zero modular function, which was a Haupt module for one of these genus zero groups. So the function that mapped the fundamental domain to, to the um, Riemann sphere. Now, in a very nice paper by uh, Miranda and John, this story was expanded further, and the genus zero property that we found was used to actually classify the Jacobi forms and the mock modular forms that could appear um, in umbral moonshine. They did this by classifying uh, what they called optimal mock Jacobi theta functions, which included all of the ones in umbral moonshine plus a finite additional number. And they showed that they were classified by 39 what are called non genus zero groups. I'll explain some of this a little bit more. So in penumbral moonshine, it started with Thompson moonshine, which I will write, I'll write down a modular function that exhibits this a little bit later. And similarly, it's been expanded, but expanded in a way that we don't understand nearly as well as in umbral moonshine. There are various other groups that are appearing. Um, so G2 of 3 means you take the Lie algebra of G2, but you now work over the field with three elements, and 3 dot means that the group actually has a Z3 normal subgroup, and the quotient is this G2 of 3. But anyway, this is funny notation for finite groups, but these are large, not exactly sporadic, but still interesting groups. And there are connections to lifts and generalized moonshine, but we don't have the big picture. We don't have a classification by Niemeyer lattices or some other kind of lattices. But what we do have is the analog of the bigger picture that Miranda and John derive for umbral moonshine. That is a classification by genus zero groups, sorry, by genus zero groups, and um, a connection with what are called skew holomorphic Jacobi forms. So we really have these two parallel worlds of moonshine, the umbral one and the penumbral one, and it involves these kind of parallel structures. So um, because I have limited time, I think I will move on, and in the rest of the talk, I'll try to answer a few of the questions that you might have from this very broad brush outline. So some of the questions are, what is a skew holomorphic Jacobi form? I've never heard of this before. Uh, what are the fricky and non fricky genus zero groups that I'm talking about? What role does genus zero play since it both classifies these new kinds of moonshine and governs monstrous moonshine? What are some examples of penumbral moonshine? And finally, what does it all mean? You'll note that I only promised to answer some of these questions, not all of the questions. So what is a skew holomorphic Jacobi form? You just heard the definition of a Jacobi form, and that's the way that it's usually presented in terms of the elliptic and modular transformation properties. I'm going to give a slightly different definition because it allows me to bring out a certain parallel. And I'm only going to talk about um, Jacobi forms of weight 1 and index m, but it's trivial to generalize it. So Jacobi forms is defined in this in a book by Eichler and Zagier, um, can our functions of 
the modular parameter tau at an elliptic variable z, which can be expanded in terms of some theta level m theta functions, which are basically just a kind of flavored version of the ordinary theta functions that we find in, say, free fermion theories, and then a vector-valued modular form of weta half. Now, one really ought to get used to the idea that these things are a little bit more than just modular forms in the same way that long ago we got used to the idea that um, spin a half fermions are not really representations of the rotation group, but a double cover of the rotation group. So weight, half integer weight modular forms really um, transform under a double cover of the modular group. And this goes by the name of the Ve representation of the metaplectic group. Uh, if you actually look into it, it's not very scary. It just looks like problems that occur in quantum mechanics. But anyway, in this expansion, the theta functions transform as a representation that I'll call m a half of rho sub m. It depends upon this um, index and its weight a half. These guys then transform according to the conjugate representation so that their product transforms as weight one. And a skew holomorphic Jacobi form simply involves taking the components in this theta expansion and making them anti-holomorphic in tau. Now, that has the consequence that, so, so this thing should transform correctly, that if you now take the complex conjugate of these for a skew holomorphic Jacobi form, they transform in the same, you get something that's holomorphic, but transforms in the conjugate representation to the theta components in a Jacobi form. So in other words, these things are just a represent, in terms of holomorphic vector-valued forms, these things transform according to a representation and its conjugate. So that, it's a very natural mathematical parallel to introduce these skew holomorphic Jacobi forms, but they're no longer holomorphic in tau, and that makes the physical interpretation a little bit more difficult. So examples, well, it's nice to often package these things by summing the, um, summing the, the two components, if we're at m equals one, where there are two components, and rescaling tau, that gives you for the first one of these just the ordinary theta function, the sum of q to the n squared. Then there are uh, analogous functions that have higher polar terms, and these, the sequence of these um, way to half forms appeared in work of Borchards and Zagier on Borchards lifts. I think Sarah Harrison will talk a little bit more about how skew holomorphic Jacobi forms appear in some physical problems involving BPS state counting. So what are the non fricky and fricky genus zero groups? Well, there are 39 of these non fricky groups, and I've uh, listed them according to the notation that I mentioned to you earlier. You probably don't care about the details. Um, I've put a yellow little uh, highlighter here over the ones that appear in the umbral moonshine that are classified by Niemeyer lattices. It's an interesting question, which I don't think has been determined, whether all these other ones correspond to some kind of finite group structure or lattices, probably rather small finite groups if they do. Now, I said that the penumbra was bigger than the umbra, and indeed, if you look at the Fricka genus zero groups, which should classify penumbral moonshine, there are 84 of them. So it's a much longer list, and for each one of these 84 genus zero groups, one ought to go look for moonshine. And since just one case of moonshine can take quite a while to fully work out and understand, you can see that it's kind of a daunting problem. So what role does genus zero play? Um, I don't think anybody really knows. It's a very deep question, but there's a way of recasting it in terms of a different problem, which may shed some light on it. So that involves um, work of Rademacher. The uh, J function, which you heard about, um, is a weight zero modular form for the full modular group. It has a singular term, q to the minus one, as you go to tau equals i infinity. And Rademacher famously showed that you could construct this by taking q to the minus one, averaging it over the modular group, dividing by the subgroup that leaves it invariant, generated by tau goes to tau plus n, tau plus one. Uh, but it's well known that when you do that, you, you, that's a standard way of constructing modular forms, but at weight zero, it doesn't converge. 
so you have to regularize. So there's a regularization. This was generalized to other genus zero groups and other genus zero functions, their help modules. Um, and the regulator preserves holomorphy, but it's not obviously modular. So you have to figure out whether you're going to get something modular or not. And um, in the um, physics literature, this story goes under the name of uh, fairy tales and was worked out by these gentlemen in a couple of papers. And it has an interpretation as a sum over asymptotic ADS3 geometries with a T2 boundary. So the obstruction to modularity of Rademacher sums can be expressed in terms of a short exact sequence. These are weakly holomorphic modular forms of weight K. These are what are called mock modular forms, an example of which you heard about in the previous talk. And these are what are called cusp forms of weight 2 minus K. Cusp forms are modular forms that are finite, as, that go to zero as you go off to I infinity. So the point of this is that when the space of these forms is zero, then there is no obstruction to the modularity of the Rademacher series. And at weight zero, k equals zero here, this is a question about the existence of weight two cusp forms. If there are no weight two cusp forms, then Rademacher gives you modular objects. If there are, there's an obstruction, it produces mock modular forms. This is one of the ways you can define what a mock modular form is. It's what Rademacher gives you when there is, is an obstruction to modularity. The role of weight two is that if you have a weight two cusp form, then S, then S of tau d tau is a holomorphic one form on the quotient. And you can only have holomorphic one forms on a Riemann surface that has genus greater than zero. So genus zero means no weight two cusp forms. No weight two cusp forms means Rademacher gives you something modular. So if you replace genus zero by saying this thing should have an expression as a Rademacher sum, that implies genus zero and is a different way of casting it. And this uh, generalization can be extended to weight a half and the representations of this metaplectic group that show up in both umbral and penumbral moonshine. It's a more subtle argument. Uh, it go, it's based on work that started with work of Shamur and Shintani, and I'm, I think I definitely don't have time to discuss it. But you can basically map this problem to a problem of, of integer weight, so that if you want to know whether there's an obstruction to modularity at weight 3 halves, which would be relevant to weight 1 half, you can show that that vanishes when uh, the space of weight two uh, cusp forms vanishes for a certain subgroup. So it's a little bit more subtle than that. You often have to study when you have rational coefficients. But the upshot of all this is the classification by Cheng and Duncan that showed that all the forms of umbral moonshine and a few more are classified by genus zero groups, the non fricky groups, and a generalization that shows that genus zero classifies all the um, penumbral cases. So what are some examples? Um, well, you have to give a criterion for what kind of skew holomorphic Jacobi forms. This is kind of a generalization of what we did for umbral moonshine. It's related to a kind of optimality condition on the growth of the coefficients. Um, because I'm running out of time, I'll just flash a couple of examples. So the Thompson moonshine example was the next in that series that I showed you, F3 plus 248 times the ordinary theta function. And there are various decompositions here. You might see 248 here and ask what this has to do with E8. Uh, the answer is that the Thompson sporadic group, which is the group of moonshine here, uh, can be constructed as a subgroup of E8, but E8 over the field with three elements. Um, at discriminant three, there are um, a series of groups and a series of examples of moonshine. Um, but my microphone is kicking out and time is short, so maybe I won't go through these. But you get a series of groups that make it look like as you go up in M, you're looking at subgroups that are centralizers of elements of order M. Uh, and then there are some other examples. Uh, and you find examples that were known before. So there's something called, the, uh, there's a CFT with central charge 23 and a half. 
which is what you get by taking an icing model away from the monster theory. As baby monster theory, symmetry, we find that. And we even find moonshine for the monster, but at weight a half. So if you take the Dedekind eta function times j, you don't have to be able to add 1 to 196883 in order to see moonshine. Uh, you just see irreducible representations of the monster at the lowest order in this expansion. Essentially because multiplying j by eta, other than the vacuum character, is decomposing j into Virasoro characters. So what does it all mean? Mathematically, it looks like umbral moonshine and penumbral moonshine, which remains to be fully worked out, are two sides of the same coin. There's a strong mathematical similarity in terms of the representation theory. There is a kind of parallel classification by genus zero groups. And there are many connections, which I don't have time to explain, both to generalized moonshine via the groups that appear there and via lifts. One example of this is that for each prime dividing the order of the monster, you can actually construct the uh, twisted partition function as a lift, a Borchard's lift, of one of the weight to half forms appearing in skew holomorphic moonshine. And uh, there's also other intricate relations between these lists, lifts. So on the physics side, there's something really curious that I am fascinated by. If we get the partition function of a conformal field theory or a twined by some symmetry group from a lift, what is the CFT interpretation of the thing that we're lifting? So we know in examples of black hole counting, that if you, for example, take the elliptic genus of K3, it has a lift to a Siegel form which counts non-perturbative black holes in theories with n equals 4. So there we have a lift, we have the thing that we're lifting, and we have a physical interpretation of both. But I don't know a physical interpretation of the forms that you lift to get these CFT partition functions, and it looks like there ought to be some structure there. Uh, where do skew holomorphic Jacobi forms and, and, and uh, penumbral moonshine appear in physics? That we don't really know, but Sarah will discuss some first attempts in understanding that, among other things. And um, the string theory provided an understanding of how we should actually construct an infinite set of vector spaces that have these actions of these groups that are appearing in umbral and penumbral moonshine. That is explicit constructions of the modules. So um, I will end there, and thank you, and uh, please look for the moon tonight. It should be full, bright, and I, th I believe that Saturn is also close to it and perhaps visible by the, with the naked eye. So enjoy the moonshine later tonight. Well, thanks here for the uh, beautiful talk. Uh, uh, Hiroshi, have any kind of weather forecast uh, for, for watching the moon? Uh. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, any question? Over here. So you gave a nice explanation of how the uh, weight two cusp forms for the um, Rademacher obstruction space are related to genus zero. But in the generalization um, to the obstruction for weight one half, I think it was? Yeah. One half or minus one half? Anyway, you had the obstruction space was weight three halves forms. Right. What's the, how would you explain the relation of that to genus zero? There's a, there's a map, which is this map that started with work of Shimura and Shintani between weight three halves and weight two cusp forms. Oh, I see. Okay. And so you translate it into. It's the lift. Then. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Other question? In the, in the back. You might not care to answer this question, but do you, do you speculate what this, all this could mean? Well, uh, you know, there was a famous speculation by Edward that pure 3D gravity should be dual to a series of extremal CFTs 
that starts with the monster. Now, I think the evidence for that is not very strong, that there's this infinite sequence, and the monster theory, it may be true, but it's very, we don't really have techniques for exploring that using, I mean, it's not in the semi-classical regime. So this gives one the freedom to speculate that um, there could be a counting problem for black holes um, that's not accessible in semi-classical gravity where the black holes really do transform, have, have multiplicities that are representations of interesting sporadic groups. Um, I would love like, something like that to be the case because there's really a remarkable parallel between the, the more sophisticated levels of black hole counting and the constructions in moonshine. As a matter of fact, Umber Moonshine was very strongly motivated by a paper by Dabblecar, Murthy, and Zagier that showed how mock modular forms appear in black hole count. But there's just some slight modifications between the structures. So um, I don't know quite what it all means, but, I, but there, this parallel structure, I mean, sometimes mathematics just describes two things that don't have anything to do with each other. But there, it, the parallels are so close that I really feel like there should either be some class of black holes or ones that are not accessible now where moonshine could appear. That's one possibility. I think we, we get used to things that seem miraculous, but we should not get used to this, these kind of miraculous things in moonshine because we really don't understand them and we don't understand why they're there. Other question? Uh, okay, next thanks to speak again. Okay, so the uh, last talk of today is by uh, Sarah Harrison. Uh, uh, continue on number three and physics. This one. And, uh, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. All right, okay. I'd like to start by uh, thanking the organizers uh, as did all the other speakers for all the work they put into uh, organizing this wonderful conference and for inviting me to talk to you guys today. So I'm going to be talking about joint work with this uh, wonderful set of collaborators um, based on two papers, one which has already appeared and one which will hopefully appear at some point soon. And I'd also like to start by thanking professors Aguchi and Harvey for giving such a beautiful introduction to moonshine and various objects in number theory, which I'm going to use in my talk so that I won't have to uh, reintroduce them to you. All right, but before we get into uh, number theory and string theory, I'd like to start with a bit of motivation um, in case you fall asleep waiting for the banquet or the moonshine tonight. Um, uh, if you don't take anything away from my talk, perhaps you'll uh, be able to follow the first few minutes. So we're all here at the strings conference because we found that string theory and its various incarnations accommodate a really wide variety of phys different physical phenomena from black holes and holography to interesting dynamics and field theories and even um, cosmology and quantum entanglement. And perhaps one of the reasons why string theory accommodates such a vast range of physical phenomena is that there are many different ways to describe it. Um, some of which are very old techniques, um, such as uh, perturbation theory um, in world sheet quantum field theory and space-time quantum field theory, but also more um, surprising or exotic uh, mathematical t techniques, such as um, algebraic geometry when considering string compactifications, as well as uh, conformal symmetry, which is very powerful in holography. And combinations of these different techniques elucidate uh, the richness of string theory in many different ways. And one, just one example is that one can, for example, reinterpret certain dualities within field theory um, as geometric symmetries once one embeds into string theory. So that's one of the perhaps 
the surprising or uh, interesting lenses with which to view various uh, ph physical phenomena which arise in string theory. So in my talk, I'd like to propose there's yet another tool um, which can be very powerful and which thus far has been underexploited um, by string theorists, and this tool is number theory. And we've seen two beautiful talks about the relation between number theory and string theory. Um, and I'd like to focus on um, two particular physical examples, kind of two little vignettes, where I think number theory has something to teach us about physics. But I expect there are many more examples than just the ones you'll hear about today. So these are the two examples that I'm going to spend the rest of my talk uh, discussing. And the kind of questions, the kind of physical questions that I have in mind um, when studying these examples uh, that I think number theory might be able to help us uh, with making, at least starting to make an attempt to answer, are of the following flavor. So what are the symmetries of string theory? Um, we know that there are many different solutions. So one question you can ask is if there are new ways to think about or organize very, at least very special um, solutions of string theory which have a lot of symmetry. And then a second question is um, how does modularity in particular, which is, plays such a fundamental role in number theory, um, and it's many different forms, some of which were uh, mentioned in the previous talks and some of which I'll discuss here, relate to uh, the many kinds of physical phenomena that we observe in both quantum field theory and string theory. Okay, so with that, uh, let me start by talking about my first, uh, first physical example, which is that of MSW strings. And in this part of the talk, um, two objects which you've heard about in the previous top talks will appear, the first being skew holomorphic Jacobi forms, and the second being mock modular forms. So let me remind you of the basic physical setup. So these uh, gentlemen uh, considered the following uh, situation in M theory uh, in order to describe the entropy of black holes. Consider uh, M an M5 brain or a stack of M5 brains wrapped on a four cycle, which I'll denote as P, in a Calabi-Yau threefold. The space-time dimension, you'll get a string uh, in five space-time dimensions, which we refer to as the MSW string after these authors. And on the world sheet of the string, there's a 0 comma 4 supersymmetry. And they propose that um, this world sheet conformal field theory gov governs the entropy of these kinds of black holes in M theory. So in particular, one can consider a supersymmetric index of the type that uh, Professor Gucci talked about, which counts world sheet BPS states but now in this zero comma four world sheet uh, informal field theory. And we'll, denote, we'll call it the modified elliptic genus because it's slightly different than a usual elliptic genus. It has a few uh, extra insertions of F and it has a bunch of chemical potentials for various charges which depend on the geometry of the threefold in the, in the particular four cycle you pick. But these details won't be too important. And in general, this index is not holomorphic, like the elliptic genus, yet it still has modular properties. In particular, um, because it depends on both tau and tau, tau bar, it transforms with a weight in tau and a weight in tau bar, and the weight turns out to be minus 3 halves comma 1 half. And the, the symmetry of the, the uh, n equals 4 superconformal algebra on the world sheet implies that this type of index has a theta decomposition. And this theta decomposition, uh, this is a familiar siegel narain type theta function, and the specifics of it depend on the ge geometry of the four cycle P. And the coefficients in this theta decomposition are modular in mock modular forms. Um, they're usually modular if you consider one five brain, but once you consider multiple five brains uh, wrapped on the four cycle, these become mock modular. So I want to point out just one particular example of such uh, elliptic genus and talk about some of its interesting properties. So we discussed several examples in our paper and I'm, there are many, many more to explore, but I'll just point out one. Um, and this is the case when you consider a single five brain on a four cycle, uh, which is known as the uh, half K3 surface. It has the following second cohomology, which uh, reminds you of roughly half the cohomology of a K3 surface, and this is where it gets its name. And in this case, the index has the following form. 
it's the, these familiar modular functions, e4 over a to the 10th of the 12th, times um, uh, an odd, a theta function for an odd unimodular lattice of signature 1 comma 1. And this theta function depends on a modulus, which I call r. And you can think of r as the size of an elliptic fiber in this half k3. So in general, this is just that, this transforms just like that minus weight 3 halves comma 1 half a non-holomorphic modular form you saw on the previous slide. But for very special values of this modulus r, uh, in particular when r squared is um, an integer, uh, this, uh, this index is, uh, decomposes as 1 over a to the 6 times a weight 2 skew holomorphic Jacobi form, which has the same kind of properties that Jeff talked about in the talk just previously, though he was focusing on the case of weight 1. So I give you one particular example for the value of r squared equals 3, and you see that this weight 2 skew holomorphic Jacobi form has this kind of decomposition in anti-holomorphic piece times this coefficient, which uh, we showed to be a kind of moonshine type function for a Mathieu group called M12. So I'll just, just after having given you just one example, I want to make some comments about this case. So this is very reminiscent of the original observation that Aguchi-san described uh, relating Mathieu moonshine to the elliptic genus of the K3 surface. So it's a, uh, in both cases, there's a BPS index, and coefficients counting the degeneracies of BPS states have a connection to a particular um, sporadic simple group. However, there are a few differences with the original observation about Mathieu moonshine. The first of all is that the representations come with both positive and negative signs um, in the case of the half K3 surface. So you might say this is kind of natural from the point of view of supersymmetry because often we'll count fermionic states with minus signs and bosonic states with plus signs. But from the mathematical point of view, the rules are much, uh, much less strict once you allow this to happen. So the connection between finite groups, modular forms, and also geometry starts to become seemingly pervasive once we allow um, even a few number of minus signs at low orders. So whether or not one wants to actually call this moonshine is up for debate, but I think there are a few interesting physical properties nevertheless, which is, first of all, that for the, uh, for the modified elliptic genus that I've been discussing, um, this special skew holomorphic type property um, appears at very special points in moduli space. So one can consider compactifications of a string on, a, on some kind of lattice, and at rational points, um, the skew holomorphic property of the index appears. And in the case of the MSW string, we show that um, at attractor points, and unfortunately I don't have time to explain the attractor mechanism in detail, but for those who know, these are very special solutions of string theory. So at attractor points, this index has um, a skew holomorphic property as well. So this leads one to ask whether moonshine or these kind of number theoretic properties can give us a new insight, new ways to organize um, very special solutions of string theory. Okay. So that was um, the first part of my talk. And now I want to go to a totally different example, which is a connection between number theory and three-dimensional n equals two quantum field theory. And I'll explain what these um, objects are um, as I go throughout and why these pictures are here. <laughs> okay, so let's start with the setup again. Again, um, we'll consider five brains now wrapped on a three-dimensional manifold, which I'll call M3. Um, and this leads to the so-called 3D, 3D correspondence, um, which was first discussed by these, uh, these fellows. And it relates a three-dimensional n equals two theory in space-time to a churn simons theory on this three-manifold M3, where topological invariants that one can compute in churn simons theory are related to certain BPS quantities in the 3D n equals two theory. And in the particular examples that I'll consider, we'll consider uh, the gauge group of churn simons theory to be SU2, so two five brains on the and again, I'd like to discuss a particular index um, of the, the type that was discussed in Natalie Paquette's talk, a so-called half index. Um, and it's an index of the three-dimensional n equals two theory 
on the manifold, uh, the disk times the circle, so D2 times S1. And this manifold has a boundary, a two-dimensional boundary, so one has to specify boundary conditions in defining this index. And we'll specify a particular kind of two-dimensional n equals zero two boundary condition. And it turns out there, there are special boundary conditions labeled by abelian flat connections on the three-manifold M3. Um, so these are solutions to the path integral of the simons theory on M3. And I'll take this um, Q variable to be e to the two pi i tau, where tau, uh, where Q defines a certain twist in the n equals two theory, and tau you can think of as a modular parameter of the two-dimensional toroidal boundary. And since I'll be discussing this index sometimes as a function of Q and sometimes as a function of tau, um, Q you can think of as living in the unit disk, and tau lives in the upper half plane. So when I'm talking, when I refer to tau or the upper half plane, I'm talking about this variable. When I refer to the unit disk, I'm talking about this cube. And these functions are often called homological blocks for um, various um, mathematical reasons I don't want to discuss in detail, but I'll stick to just calling this index z hat. Okay. So there are two important physical quantities that the z hat were conjectured to play a role in as building blocks. The first is uh, naturally associated to Chern Simons theory on the three dimensional manifold. And these um, people conjectured that the z hats um, are building blocks of just the partition function of SU2 Chern Simons theory on the three manifold M3 when you take this variable Q to be e to the 2 pi i over k. And k is the effective coupling of the Chern Simons theory. So the point to pay attention to is that um, in this um, quantity, one wants to evaluate these z hats when q approaches a root of unity. And the second uh, physical quantity that these z hats are conjectured to play a role in is, this, is more naturally associated to the 3D n equals 2 theory. Um, and they conjecture that these uh, are building blocks of the superconformal index. So a certain partition function of 3D n equals 2 theory on S2 times S1. And the z hats appear in the following form, kind of like gluing together two different half indices with a particular twist, where one of the z hats is a function of q and one is a function of 1 over q. So you see that it's important um, in order to make sense of this kind of definition to be able to continue this z hat um, to outside of the unit circle. Um, so taking 1 over q takes tau from the upper half plane to the lower half plane. So one has to know a way to do this in order to make sense of, of this conjecture. OK, so I'll give you a little idea of how one can compute these z hats. So for um, particular theories where one has a Lagrangian description of the 3D n equals 2 theory, one can compute it in, with a localization type formula, which contains degrees of freedom, which are naturally three-dimensional, um, coming from the bulk 3D theory, as well as degrees of freedom, which are more naturally two-dimensional and associated to the boundary. So one might ask um, several questions about the properties um, of this index z hat and how it relates to the physics. So the first question I'd like to ask is, are there, what are, if any, the modularity properties of these z hats? And uh, you'll notice that if the 3D theory is totally trivial, this F3D is just one. And one gets basically the two-dimensional elliptic genus of the boundary, and the z hat is just a regular modular form. However, if the um, 3D degrees of freedom contribute non-trivially, the modular properties will be spoiled in some way. And I'll discuss a particular set of examples of um, 3D theories where one gets spoiled modularity um, in a very precise way, um, where the z hats are naturally um, what are known as false theta functions, which I'll explain in a moment, or mock modular forms. And then a few other questions one might want to ask is, what does this modularity property have to do with the physics of the system? And with the idea of the, the conjecture about the superconformal index in mind, how would, can one define z hat of q inverse? 
So uh, on this slide, I give you just a little bit more detail, technical detail about how one can compute these uh, z hats for a particular um, example of the 3D 3D correspondence. I don't want to spend um, too much time on this, but I'm going to mention an example which is written in terms of a plumbing diagram. So I'll just quickly explain what that is to you. So a plumbing diagram is just a graph with some um, nodes and edges between them, which have, where the nodes have some weights. And this plumbing diagram can both specify the uh, topology of the three-manifold M3, as well as the Lagrangian um, of the three-dimensional theory um, in space-time, um, where the graph indicates some set of links, which you then remove little tori around them, do some twists, and glue them back in. Uh, in order to get the three manifold. And on the other hand, one can define a so-called linking matrix given the data of these nodes and edges. And this linking matrix encodes certain couplings in the Lagrangian of the 3D n equals two theory. And then there's a very precise formula, contour integral formula for these Z hats once one has a linking matrix. So I'm just gonna tell you the answer of the Z hat for a particular example of a three manifold which has the following linking matrix. This manifold is also um, a, what is called a Brieskorn sphere, for those who are familiar with, which is an intersection of two surfaces in, in C3 of the following form, a unit, um, a unit sphere in C3 with the following um, um, polynomial and three variables where the exponents are given by these two, three, and seven. And the result is that, well, there's only one abelian flat connection on this manifold M3, and so there's only one z hat, and it has the following Q expansion. And I want to point out that this Q expansion can be written in terms of this function psi, which is known as a false theta function, which I want to briefly explain to you right now. So this psi, um, well, first of all, I have a, in the exponent a label which corresponds to a three-dimensional representation of SL2z. And in fact, this notation descends uh, is very related to the notation for genus zero groups that Jeff mentioned in his talk previously. So certain groups with um, various, one can think of this as a group of exact divisors that um, Jeff mentioned. These kinds of groups also have another interpretation. They allow one to define irreducible vector valued representations of SL2Z. So one can think of this psi one, uh, this false theta function as being one component in a three dimensional um, vector. Furthermore, this psi is composed of these building blocks, which are very similar to usual theta series, except half of the terms have a minus sign. And that's why they're referred to as false theta functions. So if all of these terms had a plus sign, it would just be a usual theta series. But since roughly half of them have a minus sign, this these functions are not modular. And there's a mathematical word for this um, kind of object. The word is holomorphic Eichler integral of a weight three halves theta series. But in any case, the important point is that these size are not modular functions or even modular forms. And I just briefly want to mention some very interesting work that I unfortunately won't be able to really tell you any details about, which is that the the transformation, well, they're not modular, but they still have a very specific kind of transformation property in this large k limit. So if one considers uh, the large k limit of this false theta function, it's governed by a perturbative series in one over k and a, um, an S matrix associated to a particular vector valued representation of the modular group SL2Z. And there's very interesting work by these authors connecting um, the ideas of resurgence to complex Trent-Simons theory um, via the um, number theoretic properties of this false data function psi. But now I want to talk about one of the questions I mentioned earlier, which is how does one define this z hat of Q inverse? So how does one continue tau from the upper half plane to the lower half plane, or Q from inside the unit disk to outside of the unit circle. And in the particular example that I mentioned, it turns out that there's a very simple solution. This psi, in fact, has a hypergeometric series representation um, of the following form. So this is precisely the Q series 
of the Z hat that was on uh, the previous slide. Um, and in fact, this function converges for Q both inside the unit disk and outside the unit circle. So one can just substitute Q with one over Q directly in this hypergeometric series and get something which is still convergent. And um, once one does this, one gets this hypergeometric series, which is in fact a mock modular form. It's one of Ramanujan's mock theta functions. So for the particular case of this three manifold here, uh, sigma of 237, um, one can literally just continue the z hat from q to q inverse and get a mock theta function. So the idea is that when tau goes from the upper half plane to the lower half plane, there are two different functions with two different q series expansions. They both converge, but they have very different modular properties, sort of like when you look in a mirror and you get a very distorted image. So in the remaining time, I want to address the question of, the, um, of what happens when Q approaches um, um, roots of unity. And I'd like to introduce one more object in number theory, which was first um, named by Don Zagier, uh, which is a quant what is called a quantum modular form. So a quantum modular form is very different than the kind of objects that have been discussed in all the talks this afternoon thus far. It's only defined uh, on the rationals. It's not defined on an open set of C. And um, I've listened here, listen, I've written here basically what uh, Don Zagier wrote down in his original definition, which is not, you'll notice it's not really a definition, it's purposefully vague, because he wanted to en encapsulate at the same time a number of different um, kind of strange observations that he saw. Um, so the rough definition that he gave, which is really all we have to work with, is that this function Q, which is defined on the rationals, um, well, if you take Q itself and subtract from it its modular transformation, one gets a so-called period function P, and this period function extends to some kind of function of R, perhaps with a few points removed, and has some kind of nice properties. And in the, in the particular context of the 3D, 3D correspondence, if one takes this z hat of q, this false theta function, which is defined inside the unit disk, and considers the radial limit as one goes to a root of unity, or tau going to a rational point, uh, one gets the value of the turn simons partition function um, at, that, uh, at that value of q. And so it's kind of like starting with a function which converges inside of a unit disk, approaching um, the various uh, discrete set of points on the unit circle and getting a bunch of different values, like these various different images around the circle. So I'd just like to make one more comment about um, the connection between false theta functions, mock modular forms, and quantum modular forms before I conclude, which is that both the false theta functions and mock modular forms um, have a very close to connection to to quantum modular forms. If you start with a false theta function and continue um, its, its, um, its, and consider its radial limit, the radial limit of Q, or tau going to a particular rational point, um, its asymptotic expansion defines a quantum modular form. On the other hand, if you start with a mock modular form and con consider this uh, shadow term, which completes it to a modular form, uh, its radial limit also has the same uh, asymptotic expansion. So it leads to the same uh, quantum modular form from the other side of the plane. And for more complicated uh, three manifolds, uh, one may not see z hats which have the structure of false theta functions or mock modular forms, but we expect the structure of qu the quantum modular form to, to survive. So unfortunately, I can't um, explain this um, in more detail in the time I have. But I want to summarize a bit. So for the second part of my talk, the point is basically that for many 3D theories, false theta functions are natural number theoretic objects which appear in this so-called half index for a special kind of manifold. And in many cases, these false theta functions can be continued to the lower half plane to obtain mock modular forms. 
And finally, quantum modular forms, which are only defined on rational points, capture the value of the turn simons path integral um, for particular values of the coupling. And we expect that these, um, these objects will play a role more generally. So since I'm basically out of time, I'll just conclude um, by mentioning that there are many um, interesting open questions that we're exploring, including the relation between modularity and resurgence, many mo modular forms which appear in umbral moonshine appear in this context, and we don't really know why, as well as um, interpretations of Rademacher Mo expansions for both false theta functions and mock theta functions. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks, sir, for a very nice talk. Any question? Um, you said that uh, some of the modular, mock modular forms of umbral moonshine appeared. Is it, is it actually the mock modular forms that exhibit moonshine, or is there, is there, there shadows and the Eichler integrals of their shadows that appear? Um, well, it depends on what question you ask, I think. So um, the Eichler integral of the shadow plays an important role in defining the quantum modular form on the other half of the plane. But for certain, um, certain of the false theta functions, which have an explicit hypergeometric representation, if you just want to continue from Q to 1 over Q, you'll get, you can precisely get a mock theta function, which may appear um, in moonshine. OK, thanks. The quick. Uh. So in the formula, could you show the for, flash the slide with the formula for Q of X as a limit as T goes to zero? Yeah. yeah. I, I wasn't quite sure why, why are you showing the T series, the asymptotics? I mean, I understand the claim is that, that as T goes to zero, you're getting a quantum. Yeah. Um, so we're Modular form, but it's what's the, what's the role in this slide of this next line? It's x equals zero, giving the t. S oh, I'm just particular picking a particular rational point x, yeah. um, and then considering the um, the limit from uh, above to the real axis. Axis. So this uh, psi is defined for tau in the upper half plane. Right. Right. We want to consider the. Um, we want to consider the quantum modular form around a particular value. No, I, I understand the equation. I'm just oh. asking why are you writing it? Why? Oh, yeah. I just want What's the significance of oh, this? Oh, the significance expansion? is that if one then goes to the lower half plane and considers the Eichler integral of the, okay. the shadow, one yeah. gets exactly the same asymptotic expansion. Ah, so yeah. the fact that these two series agree if t goes to minus t. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's okay. the point. Okay. It's to demonstrate this. I, I see. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. so the, the other question I had is the false theta functions. So, so there, are, there are theta functions you can make for indefinite lattices where you regularize by using an error function. I'm sure you're aware of those. Vineris et al. study yeah. those things. So um, if I take limits in which the error function becomes the sine function, is that related to your false theta functions? I'm so, not totally sure. I don't think OK, because it looked like they could, because yeah. the error function can go either to plus or minus. And, yeah. You know, it, can be, it, can be, it can be a sign of, of lambda dot a vector. Mm -hmm. And then it looked a little like what you were writing. Thank you. More questions? OK, big thanks to the speaker again. Thanks. OK, so this is a wrap up the Thursday section. Uh, enjoy the dinner. So uh, we have a few announcements about the transportation to the banquet venue and for those uh, who are not attending. The